Good morning, good afternoon, good morning, Bay, uh, West Coast, good afternoon, East Coast, United States, good evening, Palestine, and good evening, many people also in Africa who might be joining us. We are very happy to be here today. We start, as always, with acknowledging that San Francisco State University sits on stolen indigenous Ohlone people's land, and we always remind ourselves of this acknowledgement. I turn it over now to my uh, colleagues, my comrades, my sister and brother, Gail Walker and Sam Anderson, who are co-moderating because we start with the acknowledgement first, then we will come to why we're here, what we are doing and so on. So Gail, to you. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. And um, yes, it's. Uh, I think that there are so many different um, uh, uh, entities, organizations, individuals that we can lift up and, and acknowledge, um, but grateful to the uh, to the uh, university, grateful to uh, uh, you, uh, Dr. Abdulhani, and our comrades uh, who are joining us from the university to make this very important uh, conversation uh, happen and to be a part of it. And of course, my dear brother, Sam Anderson, who um, has been in such an instrumental role in um, uh, helping to uh, uh, have this conversation about this important piece of history. Um, in terms of acknowledgement, I think that there are so many uh, that we can and need to acknowledge uh, who um, we've lost uh, over the, the, oh, the periods of time, uh, but we're grateful for those who have stepped forward, who have been um, really key um, allies and, and activists uh, in the fight for uh, a free Palestine, and uh, grateful to be a part of this uh, of this uh, tremendous conversation. Um, I'll pass it now to my brother Sam Anderson, and uh, uh, continue to join in the conversation. Sam. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning um, to the world. Uh, we uh, like to start off um, honoring those, as mentioned, uh, who passed on, those activists that have passed on uh, over the past 50 years who have played instrumental roles in uh, forging solidarity between uh, uh, people of African descent and Palestine, and particularly those in, in the United States. And i just like to um, uh, pay tribute to uh, the late Bill Epton, and the late Lucius Walker, Gail's father, uh, yes. Reverend Lucius Walker. Um, there are a host of others, Queen Mother Moore, there's another, uh, Ilambe Brad, there's another, um, Kwame Ture, there's another. Uh, we have a number of sisters and brothers who, Gwen Patton Woods is another who, who we could invoke. Um, it, I think it's extremely important that we uh, honor those people and that the younger forces in the world understand that they are continuing a very powerful revolutionary revolutionary legacy when they stand with Palestine or when they stand with Black America or when they stand with Black people in the diaspora in general. Uh, and so hopefully this afternoon, this morning, this evening, you'll be able to see uh, or, or hear um, uh, those important uh, historical uh, elements that led up to the creation of this statement and also how we can follow through in the 21st century uh, to, to consolidate uh, and make that bond between um, uh, Black America and Palestine particularly solid, more solid than ever before in these crazy ass times. Uh, thank you, Sam. Any of our uh, uh, esteemed guests would like to uh, make any acknowledgement? And if you don't want to do it now, we can also do it throughout the program as well, because many names are going to come out. But if you want to say something now, please go ahead. If, if I can just step in for just a second, yeah. uh, Rabab, I wanted to um, uh, just mention when you talked about youth, uh, Sam, um, we have uh, uh, many young people who have been really in solidarity with Palestine. And I think that's very heartening and powerful and important. And of course, there's uh, at least one in particular uh, young person, Rachel Corey, that comes to mind as somebody who bravely uh, stood up against the powers, uh, literally, uh, physically putting her life on the line 
And um, she's an example, I think, of uh, that youthful um, uh, energy and, and, and positive uh, power within our, our young uh, um, people that uh, would be important to remember also at this time. So I think this is really appropriate that uh, uh, Gail mentioned Rachel Corey because we are actually speaking about uh, the statement in the New York Times of black leaders on Palestine. Rachel Corey was not black. She was a white young student at Evergreen College yes. in the state of uh, Was uh, Washington who went to Palestine and stood in front of an Israeli bulldozer in Rafah. Yes. The Israeli bulldozer was going to destroy Palestinian people's home and she stood and the bulldozer would not budge. She stood as, a, as, a, as, a, as an objector and the Israeli bulldozer killed her, crushed her. And Rachel Corey and her family uh, live in, in, in uh, the Was state of Washington. Her university, Evergreen College, continues to think about her. And many people talk about that. And that takes us to the question of also the martyrs who have fallen. Uh, since the most recent uprising for black lives, when we're talking about uh, um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, many, many people before, too many names, too many names, too many victims, too many sacrifices, as well as many people who have fallen in Palestine. Many people think about Yad al-Hallaq, who was killed a few days after George Floyd and was also killed by Israeli border police in Jerusalem. And uh, now they are being indicted with very light charges. And there is a lot of protest about that. And maybe we can also come back. But the similarities and the, the comparative nature of the struggles, as well as the oppression, come back to us. We start with, uh, we also remember today, the Palestinian uh, prisoner, Maher al-Akhras, who's on his 97th day. It was 96, 99. Yeah, today is 96 or 97th day of hunger strike. And he is in prison. And he's on hunger strike because the Israeli military, which continues to occupy militarily Palestine, is refusing to press any charges against him or let him go. I mean, this is basically, he is being denied due process. And he is withholding, and Palestinians have, I guess, the largest ratio of political prisoners in the world to the size of the population. Of course, the U.S. is the largest incarcerated uh, place of all the world. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to, before we move on, I want to also uh, acknowledge that today is the National Independence Day of Algeria. And Algeria comes up a lot, so I'm going to be saving that until we have the conversation, but we want to acknowledge that this is really a very important day. But I also want to thank the team, uh, people who worked on it. First, I want to uh, thank uh, Salim Ishhade. Uh, Salim is a doctoral candidate at University of California, Los Angeles. Actually, he defended his prospectus on September 22nd, the, just the night before we were censored by Zoom for our September 23rd webinar. He defended his prospectus and went through with flying colors. And then the next day, we were struggling, which we will talk about that because this is part of the struggle, part of the work that we're doing. And Salim is uh, uh, doing his uh, dissertation on the oral history and the struggle of the generation of Palestinian students at San Francisco State University through uh, support also from Ahmed Studies Program, the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diaspora Studies Program. Salim also was an, an MA student at uh, San Francisco State, also passed his MP with, with flying colors, got so many awards, collected so many awards uh, from friends and foes. Uh, alike and this and on on his uh, field work and in terms of uh, researching actually doing the archival work and maybe we can call upon you to speak a little bit about this because you mentioned something very very interesting to me yesterday but we'll sa save that till last uh, next i would like to, to thank anais amir anais anais uh, is a, a student uh, one of the leaders of the Student for Justice in Palestine at Wellesley College. And Anais is also the founder and the president of the Arab Women's Association at Wellesley as well. Uh, Anais is also an excellent student doing really, really well in her studies in cinema and media studies and um, quote unquote Middle East studies. That's the, only, the name of the program at Wellesley. And Anais has also been really instrumental in the work that we are doing. Uh, has been actually uh, working um, as a research assistant and a researcher with me since the spring. Salim and I, we go way back since Salim started his MA at, at San Francisco State when we met back in 2015, right? 
in, I think, in, yeah, for 2015. I also want to thank uh, Sarah Sills, who is not here with us, but Sarah is an active member of the steering committee of Jewish Voice for Peace, New York City. Sarah has been doing all these beautiful graphics for us free of charge. And I have to say that because it's the labor that does not get acknowledged about all the stuff that makes things happen. People see something happen and they say, it just happened. But there is a lot of labor. And I think we want to talk about the intellectual labor, the physical labor, the labor of love, the labor of pain, of suffering that brings people together and keep us all going. And Sarah has, and, and Sarah always, we, we say, she sent us the flyer, we, say, we sent suggestions, then she changes and we sent it, and then we change the date and then we change the time. And Sarah continues, continues patiently, uh, lovingly, silently, and actually doing it, which is really, really great. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank uh, National Students for Justice in Palestine and the Eyewitness Palestine for actually hosting this. I'm going to turn it to uh, Salim to speak a little bit about what we are doing and why we're here on this platform, StreamYard, and not on Zoom. And I want to also turn it to Anais to speak about, maybe Anais, you can speak about the co-sponsors first, and then we can go to Salim if that's okay. Go ahead, Anais. Yeah, sure. So we, our co-sponsors for this event are the Alliance for Water Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace, um, Boston, Labor for Palestine, South Africa BDS Coalition, Islami Dune Palestinian Prisoner in Solidarity Network, um, Jews for Palestinian Right of Return, and the Feminist Front. So we thank you all for supporting us and sharing and continuing to help us spread the word about the open classrooms and webinars we've been we've been doing for a while now. Thank you, Anais. Uh, so we're all here um, using this, uh, not using Zoom because as Dr. Bahadi uh, made brief mention to uh, when on September 23rd, when we had the webinar with uh, Leila Khalid, uh, Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube uh, all pulled our uh, event or pulled our video um, and we were not able to uh, broadcast to the public that event. So because of the censorship, uh, we have been, we have decided to switch platforms. There's also an ongoing campaign for folks to um, push their institutions, push their universities, push whatever organization they are part of to get out of Zoom uh, and to break the kind of near uh, video conferencing monopoly uh, and hold that Zoom really has uh, on, uh, during this time of COVID and uh, to really push towards uh, open source, justice-centered companies um, that kind of don't uh, that don't engage in this form of, of of bulldozing censorship, I am going to share more information about that in the comment section. Uh, it'll be through the form of the petition that we have going that has a lot of the context to this, so that you can read more about it and, and uh, sign your name on. Uh, if you so choose to be part of this movement. I will now turn it back to um, Dr. Abdul Hadi. Yes, thank you, Salim. Uh, so we wanted to actually begin, we, we're, we're good on time. We wanted to just lay out what we're going to do today. We're going to finish, we're still doing the introduction actually, segueing into the event. And then we were going to have a discussion why we're doing this event. Uh, we already spoke about the sponsors and so on. We want to talk about why we do open classrooms. Then we're going to hear from our esteemed and amazing uh, panelists about the history, the oral history, narratives, and have a roundtable discussion. We're also going to have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers towards the end to have a lot of discussion. Actually, I think we are we're having maybe at least half an hour to do so towards the end. So uh, stay with us. This is very exciting. So before uh, we begin even about the, the, the statement itself, we wanted to uh, speak about the three major co-sponsors of the co-organizers of the event. So I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Brother Sam Anderson to speak about why the national, what is the national education, black education agenda. Then uh, uh, Sister Gail will talk about why IFCO and why, what is IFCO and why IFCO is co-sponsoring. And then I'll speak a little bit about Ahmed. So, Sam? Uh, yes, uh, the National Black Education Agenda, uh, NBEA, uh, 
came out of um, struggles around uh, multi-decade struggle around public education and around racism within the public education system in the United States, as well as the struggle for the communities, the black communities, the Latino communities to control the public education that their children get. Um, we are in the tradition of community control struggles that occurred in the 1960s in New York, in New York City, where um, grassroots uh, organizations, parents and students and, and uh, teachers who were in solidarity um, demanded community control of the public education system. We are also fighting uh, against privatization of public education. Uh, here in the United States, um, public education is being privatized, um, and that means that the, the 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 bulk of the money, the the, the tax dollars uh, that 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 go into public education is um, being siphoned off by hedge funders who push out these front organizations called school choices, charter schools, whatever. To, to get the money and the quality of education is poor. Um, the, 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 they reinforce the Eurocentric education that uh, is the norm in, in this country. They in turn, these privateers in turn, reinforce that. They also reinforce the notion that um, students uh, advance in their knowledge base by uh, taking norm reference testing, taking high 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 stakes testing, and, and instead of creating critical thinking skills, these corporations uh, create uh, testing mills in the public school system. So we we are we 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 fight against that. Our base, the National Black Education Agenda's base, is that parents should take over the school. Parents should take over the schools in coordination with those teachers who are in support, those administrators who are in support, and of course, the students who are in those schools. We have, in Black America, we have the educational expertise to produce all across this country quality uh, educational, public educational uh, schools. We have that expertise and, and what, what NBEA wants to do is to be that central point where, <clears throat> where the expertise uh, would be <clears throat> free and flowing to the uh, respective communities where, they, where parents want quality education in, in their public schools. And so um, uh, this is not a new thing. We're just continuing what had occurred some almost 50 years ago or more. Uh, within New York City and Philadelphia and uh, Chicago and a number of other uh, major urban centers where parents began to take over, uh, demand to take over the schools and, 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 and bring in quality education for black people. Uh, education for liberation is at the core of our existence and also education is a human right is at the core of our existence. So that's that's who we are in a nutshell. I'll stop unmuting myself. Thank you, uh, Sam, Dr. Sam Anderson. I would now turn it to Sister Gail to speak about IFCO and uh, why are you here and what you're doing. And of course, I'm also going again to continue saying blessings to uh, Father Lucius Walker who transitioned to the other world, who has been an amazing, amazing friend of Palestine. I'm not stealing your thunder. I'm just acknowledging. So back to you. Not very, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I'm not feeling that uh, it's stolen at all. Um, just want to you know, give uh, my deep appreciation as the current director of uh, IFCO, the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization. Um, my appreciation for being a, a part of this program to mark this very important 50-year um, uh, anniversary of uh, the historic statement uh, from Black activists and academics about solidarity with Palestine. Um, the, it was a no-brainer for IFCO uh, 
um, to be a part of this uh, uh, important programs helping to sponsor this. Um, Certainly, as you just mentioned, um, uh, uh, Dr. Abdulhadi is the my, my father, the late Reverend Lucius Walker, who was uh, an activist uh, in in his own right and uh, wore many different hats, uh, but really at this at the center of um, his being and what he represented, and as the founding director of IFCO, was really about the fight for justice, and that's what IFCO has been engaged in for the last um, well fifty three years uh, now. Uh, it's among our work, uh, the work that has been done on the national, uh, international um, uh, front, uh, fighting for anything uh, from supporting the enfranchisement of Native Americans, political prisoners, the fight against the Ku Klux Klan, the rights of workers, et cetera. But among our work has been the support of people of Palestine. Um, as a faith-based organization, we stood up to, to um, for Palestine as a matter of principle and uh, for the uh, our steadfast belief in the rights of the Palestinian people. Um, in fact, our organization uh, lost its, its tax exempt status uh, in part due to our support for a project that delivered medical aid to the people of, of Gaza. So it's just, and, and that was done um, intentionally. We said we, were, we won't back down, we won't stop uh, uh, the uh, defense of our uh, uh, beleaguered uh, friends, uh, even if it meant um, risking uh, the, the loss of our status, which happened. We did, we did regain. But, um, but that's just part of why this is important for it, it to be uh, here, to be present, and to, to be participating. And on a personal level, I just want to say when I traveled to the region, this is many years ago, I'm long overdue for a return, so I need to have some conversations with you, uh, Dr. Abduhadi, about that. Um, but I got an opportunity to visit various um, parts of the old city in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, Ramallah, uh, Jericho, Hebron. Um, and I, I saw first the brutal injustice uh, and um, and apartheid-like behavior perpetrated against the Palestinians that were forced to endure at the hands of the Israeli powers, uh, unrelenting violations of international law, occupation of the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, and the wholesale destruction of homes and the confiscation of lands and I know we'll be talking about this, but it, it, it really had such a powerful impact on me uh, to see, for example, the destruction of the beautiful ancient uh, olive trees that really represent Palestinian resistance and, and resilience. Uh, the utter disrespect for Palestinian elders and youth at checkpoints and the, the routine searches of their homes and, and um, restrictions on their movement severely limiting access to housing, decent housing and, and schools and food, hospitals, water, uh, and so much more. So as people of faith, uh, as people of faith, people of conscience, people committed to justice, uh, it's our honor and our duty to be here and to participate in all efforts to support the rights uh, uh, um, of the people of Palestine. So that's why, that's why it's all generally, and that's why Gail, personally. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your support. I know we've met uh, um, a few years ago, yeah. actually through Father uh, Walker, mm -hmm. who, uh, who has always been doing all these caravans uh, to Cuba and Latin America. And then and there is an event, like a major, major event at the church many, many years ago mm -hmm. to actually talk about Palestine and educate people. So it was really about the whole question of engaging people of faith, faith communities into that. And actually we have a few people uh, of uh, faith communities who are joining us that I know personally, so I'm hoping maybe uh, folks will, will chat. So I wanted to say a little bit why Ahmed, why this webinar. And by actually just starting by, we always, uh, we follow the tradition also, known in the US as call and response, but it's an African tradition where somebody calls the other uh, people response is also an indigenous tradition but also tradition in palestine somebody says something so you don't just move on to what you want to say next without responding without uh, responding to the call that uh, your sisters brothers your communities your kinfolk your your everybody who's comrades with you has done so i wanted to just say like today now is the olive season in palestine now we are actually going to witness and we see it again and again both people celebrating 
life, land, and joy, and picking up the olives, making olive oil, pickling the olives, making soap out of it. But also we see a lot of uh, colonists, Israeli colonists who are burning the, tree, the, the olives. Uh, we see them uh, stealing the olives from the Palestinian farmers, and we see the Israeli military actually enabling that, and also restricting the time of how, when can Palestinians go to their fears to pick up the, the olive oil and bring it on and so on. So this is part of the context. There is a lot we can talk about. I wanted to also uh, uh, maybe respond to just one thing that uh, Sam mentioned, which is the whole question of education, that we are at a time when, uh, in addition to the whole privatization of education, which I'm going to actually pass it on to Salim to speak about in terms of the webinar, we also have been targeted, particularly, and I say we, I'm talking about people who are uh, focusing their work, scholarship, teaching, and advocacy around questions for justice in for Palestine as part of the indivisibility of justice. And we have been targeted specifically by um, pro-Israel Zionist groups who are trying to accomplish a number of things. One is to actually uh, say that Palestinian education is a terrorist education in order to criminalize all Palestinian education and also in terms of actually undermining the just demands of the Palestinian educators, students, people at their universities, at schools, and so on, to have the right to, to learn, right to education. And so Israel has been actually very much involved in undermining Palestinian education. This is not new. And uh, during the Aqsa Intifada, when Israel reinvaded Palestinian uh, cities in 2001, 2002, they actually destroyed almost a million or about a million of high school diplomas of Palestinian students. Nobody understands what does this have to do, even if they're talking about the whole question of national security and so what does this have to do with it, unless the definition of Israeli national security has to do with erasure of the Palestinian people. Here in the United States, there has been, and this has been an, an amazing victory when people think, I mean, this is uh, what, what Sam talked about in terms of education, in terms of the things that we are accomplishing. Gail is talking about uh, about uh, getting the tax exempt status for IFCO back, which is a huge victory. And sometimes people get uh, so much uh, um, um, immersed or, or so much beaten up and, and brutalized by the, by the viciousness of people who are trying to put us down that sometimes we forget about these victories. But also there was uh, the, you know, the, the Trump administration appointed a man named Kenneth Marcos, who is one of the leading pro-Israel um, uh, People in the United States, he established a center called Brandeis Center for Human Rights. So the Trump administration appointed him to be the chair, uh, the head of uh, civil rights in the Department of Education. We know who's running the Department of Education, Betty DeVos and her connections and so on. But he was appointed, and there was a lot of protests against him by multiple, multiple civil rights groups, groups saying that he's not going to be able to do the job, but, they, but he got appointed anyway. And what, when Kenneth Marcus was in office, he actually went after all uh, um, Palestinian universities, Palestinian activists and advocates and so on. For example, one of the first things he took up was to attack Rutgers University, which the Zionists have already claimed that Rutgers University creates an uncomfortable climate for Jewish students and thus it is anti-Semitic. And the Department of Education, the previous department, had actually investigated and said there is no, there is nothing, this is, there, this is warrantless. This is foundless. But Kenneth Marcus was vindictive, vicious, so he went after Rutgers uh, again, went after many, many uh, uh, universities and actually ne neglected what he is supposed to do to investigate other charges of civil uh, violations and so on in many, many schools. And also, of course, facilitated the agenda of the Department of Education to basically around the whole question of everything, around the question of privatization, around the question of charter school around question of uh, uh, how uh, sexual harassment on campus, around uh, questions of gender uh, liberty, uh, sexual justice, and so on. They, he was always with all of that agenda, but he basically focused to target uh, Palestinian activists and Palestine activists and um, civil liberties group uh, led by a group called Palestine uh, Legal actually went well, signed statements, Center for Constitutional Rights, many statements signed, and American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and so on, signed the statement and went, and then he had, he was forced to, to resign at the end of um, uh, July, which was a huge, 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 important um, achievement. So I think it's really important to think about that, but this is what's going on. 
with uh, filing multiple Zionist organizations from the Stand With Us to Zahor to the Lawfare uh, Project and so on. They filed multiple, multiple um, complaints to the Department of Education against students and universities, specifically targeting them on the question of Palestine. I, uh, I'm, so I'll, 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 I'll leave it. And then they also went after many uh, groups around the whole question of uh, um, tax exam. So they targeted uh, American Association of University Professors. They've ta now they're targeting. They're actually pressuring San Francisco State, saying you may lose your, all your funding if you actually uh, continue to maybe house me and house the program that we have, and so on. So we're actually receiving a lot of pressure from the university, which we'll speak about that later on. But I didn't want to spend um, a lot of time also around the whole question of the, um, the attacks against us. But this is one of the things that we share. But one of the reasons we're doing this is because this is part of our open classroom. Uh, open classrooms, we open our classrooms to the public. Ahmed Studies believes that we are uh, reflecting and uh, translating what we call the spirit of 68. The students who went on a strike, longest strike in, in the history of the United States at our university, led by the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front. They struck, they demanded the College for Third World Studies. They demanded open admission. They demanded that students, specifically Black students, Indigenous students, other students of color, get into the university. They admitted, they demanded that they have faculty who can teach them, who can understand what they're going through, who are from their communities, who validate the experiences of community knowledge. And the students at the end, at the end of the strike, they won many of their demands. Uh, the university gave them a college of ethnic studies instead of the college for third world studies. But to uh, but what we really want to talk about here is that this is something in Ahmed that we do is bring the community with the university together, have the university being accountable to the community. So we don't do any of our classrooms, we don't do any of our webinars, only bringing only uh, people who are working in the university, only scholars in the university. We actually bring together what we call public intellectuals because people don't have to have a degree in order for them to be able to speak their accurate engage and they affect history. So we want to be able to do that. We also want to instill in among our students the sense that you cannot do your knowledge, you cannot produce your knowledge outside of accountability to the community, especially the knowledge that you're building out of the, com the community experiences. So that's another aspect of it. Also, we believe that we are with our responsibility to produce knowledge, that's what we do. So we insist on producing knowledge for justice and we insist in making that knowledge available to also our communities. I mean, this is our jobs, we get paid to do this. So this is the, we might as well do that, not only produce our knowledge in ivory towers and little cubicles away from everybody else where the knowledge doesn't really change the world, doesn't affect social change, but it ends up being a competitive grounds for between other academics themselves and so on. And we're not really interested in that. We're not interested in reinforcing individualism. We are interested in actually working for a different world and playing our world in that. So uh, this is one of, this is what, what we do in Ahmed. And for this particular today and other uh, webinars we've done, we're very much interested in commemorating occasions that basically allows us, gives us the opportunity for us to talk about what happened in the past. Because not everybody knows what happened. And we know that the goal of education, and which all we all, it's a very contested ground, we're all fighting over it, is to make people forget histories of the struggle and to make people learn a very uh, oppressive and repressive history. And this is part of also the Zionist attacks that are going today that are actually uh, criticizing critical ethnic studies, even Trump side an executive order about that. And this is battle that's going on in the schools of California. So we can talk about that. Actually, it's really, it would be really important to talk about it because they're targeting even the bill that was passed in California uh, called AB 1460 around ethnic studies. So basically uh, the, the, Zionists and, uh, the Zionists and the right wing white supremacists actually seem to have the same agenda. They collaborate with each other and they basically would like to, to silence this. So we're saying, actually, no, this is our job as scholars. This is our job as researchers. This is our job as public intellectuals to bring these communities together, to actually learn about episodes in our history, to be able to bring them forward and to understand what happened. And this is the goal of actually having this conversation today to commemorate that incredible historic statement that was published 50 years ago in the New York Times today that was led by black leaders and that basically contested the dominant 
U U.S. view, Zionist and dominant mainstream Anglo-white uh, supremacist U.S. view of, of history and of the region as one that is sub supporting of Israel. And actually, the statement came out and contested it. So we think it's really, really important to commemorate. We really need to, to think about narratives of resistance, narratives of oppression, as well as narrative of resistance. So in, in September, we commemorated the Sabra and Shatila massacre against Palestinians in Lebanon. And we continue to do that because this is really important for us to also learn about the historic moment that have passed, about the people, oral history that they can share with us. And this is why we have, and we and, and, and really produce knowledge in a way that we're all co-learning in a pedagogical manner where we come together and learn with each other. And I just wanted to say one more thing before we pass to the next point is that uh, both uh, Sam Anderson and uh, Gail Walker, as well as a member of the board of IFCO, uh, Dr. Uh, Rosemary Mealy are all also involved in uh, so, so building solidarity with Cuba, which actually has an excellent education system and it has a medical school. And I know you had meetings yesterday, uh, Gail, and I've attended uh, IFCO dinners where there were graduate students from medical school were, were, uh, were uh, being celebrated. And also we know that uh, Cuba has sent a lot of people also to help out with the COVID-19 around the world without uh, expectation of, of uh, paying back and so on. So I think it's also really important for us to think about what kind of education we want and how yes. do we educate and how do we. So this is, this is also kind of like there are so many connections at so many levels that we are thinking about and we need to actually, and this also contestation of the privatization of education. Uh, yeah, and I just want to also say that yeah. there are many yeah. uh, students from Palestine mm -hmm. that, are, um, that are studying at the Latin America School of Medicine under full scholarship. So yeah, I think a bit, maybe 100 scholarships or something. Yeah, I, there's yeah, yeah, something yeah. along that, so, but I've had an opportunity to speak to some of those students as well, mm -hmm. which is, you're, you're right, we're all interconnected, so. Yes, yes, and Cuba has been amazingly supportive of Palestine and so on. So uh, I would like to actually, Salim, I wanted to pass it back on to you because you wanted to talk about what happened with our previous webinar before we move on to this conversation, then we can make the, the connections. Um, no, I think, um, I think let's circle back to that. I, I did make a brief mention, yeah, I did make a brief mention of it earlier. Um, I did know though that uh, Dr. Sam Anderson did want to uh, open up the space with uh, the reading Mm -hmm. uh, the document. So I think that, well, that was the next, that was the next. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, yes wonderful, I wonderful. but I heard you saying you wanted to say something. So I've passed it on to you. Okay. So this is Thank what you. we're going to do. We're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, um, Anderson actually has uh, agreed, volunteered to read the statement. The statement is an appeal by black Americans against United States support for the Zionist government of Israel. Very well chosen words. So uh, Sam is going to read the statement. Then we are going to actually um, have a kind of like speak about who was in it. And then we are going to open it up to the people who are here who signed the statement to talk about oral history. Why did you sign the statement? How did you come about? What happened with it? So first we read the statement and then we're going to talk about how did it come about? What's the ethnography about it? What really exactly happened? And then we're going to open it up for discussion for the content of the statement, as well as what does it mean for today? So I'm going to pass it over to you. Yes, um, as one of the organizers and signatures of, of this um, statement, um, I, will read, I will read it. Um, it's dated, um, I mean, it's titled An Appeal by Black Americans Against United States Support for the Zionist Government of Israel, uh, November 1st, 1970. It's a New York Times advertisement by the Committee of Black Americans for Truth about the Middle East. We, the Black American signatories of this advertisement, are in complete solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters who, like us, are struggling for self-determination and an end to racist oppression. The recent bloodbath of, in Jordan, resulting in tens of thousands of dead and wounded Palestinians, would not have been possible without the encouragement, armaments, and financial aid of the United States government. American support 
for King Hussein's slaughter of Palestinian refugees and freedom fighters is consistent with its support of reactionary dictatorships throughout the world, from Cambodia and Vietnam to South Africa, Greece, and Iran. We stand with the Palestinian people in their efforts to preserve their revolution and oppose its attempted destruction by American imperialism aided by Zionist and Arab reactionaries. We state that we are not anti-Jewish, we are anti-Zionist and, and against the Zionist state of Israel, the outpost of American imperialism in the Middle East. Zionism is a reactionary racist ideology that justifies the expulsion of the Palestinian people from their homes and lands and attempts to enlist the Jewish, ma Jewish masses of Israel and elsewhere in the service of imperialism to hold back the Middle East Revolution. The Zionist Organization of America, in an ad in the New York Times of September 17, 1970, stated, it is appropriate for the United States to begin to treat Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, as a de facto ally for safeguarding of American interests, unquote. According to the National Observer on uh, May 18, 1970, the world Zionist movement is big business. Quote, when the blood flows, the money flows, observes Gottlieb Hammer, uh, chief Zionist fund collector in this country. We state that the Palestinian revolution is the vanguard of the Arab revolution and is part of the anti-colonial revolution, which is going on in places such as Vietnam, Mozambique, Angola, Brazil, Laos, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Because of its alliance with imperialism, Zionism opposes that anti-colonial revolution and especially revolutionary change in the Middle East. We state that Israel, Rhodesia, and South Africa are three privileged white settler states that came into existence by displacing indigenous peoples from their lands. Israel and South Africa each have about 4,500 political prisoners, most of whom have not been brought to, to trial. Jay Weitz, director of the Department of Colonization of Jewish Agency for Israel, stated, quote, the only possible solution lies in creating a Palestine without Arabs. And there is no other way to do this than to transfer all the Arabs to neighboring countries to move all of them out of here, unquote. That's in Dabar, published in Israel, September 29th, 1967. The South African government supported Israel during the June 1967 war. Dr. Vorster's government not only permitted South African volunteers to work in civilian and paramilitary capacities in Israel, but more than $28 million was raised by pro-apartheid South African Zionists and sent to Israel. After the June 1967 Middle East War, there was a considerable speculation about an Israel-type action against Zambia and Tanzania, countries which share a firm anti-apartheid policy and support the African liberation movement. In September 1967, South Africa's top army and Air Force officers learned at first hand about Israel's tactics in the Middle East, Middle East War from General Mordecai Hard, commander of the Israeli Air Force. He addressed between 50 and 100 officers at the Air Force College, um, Wouter Kergani Hugel. Uh, that was a quote out of the Johannesburg Sunday Express, September 10th, 1967. We state that Israel continues to support United States policies of aggression in Southeast Asia, policies that are responsible for the death and wounding of thousands of black youths. The New York Times of November 9th, 1967, 1969, 
stated that Jacques um, Talker Steiner, head of the Zionist Organization of America, uh, quote, appealed to American Jews to support Nixon's Vietnam policies. Mr. Mr. Talker Zeiner, who recently uh, returned last week from Israel, said that people uh, there are in accord with President Nixon's Vietnam policies, unquote. The November 17, 1969 New York Times stated that, administer, quote, administrative sources, uh, November 16th, released a message from uh, Israel, Israeli Premier Golda Meir calling President Nixon's November 3rd Vietnam speech meaningful, quote unquote. It contained, she said, in a personal message to Mr. Nixon congratulating him on his speech, it contained much that encourages and strengthens freedom-loving small nations, unquote. We state that the exploitation experienced by Afro-Americans, Afro Native Americans, i.e. Indians, Puerto Ricans and Chicanos, i.e. Mexican Americans, is similar to the exploitation of Palestinian Arabs and Oriental Jews by the Zionist State of Israel. Meyer Yari, General Secretary of the left Zionist Mapam, United Workers Party, at the party's fourth Congress in 1963 said, quote, this social exploitation helps hold the Oriental communities, one half of the population, in their state of economic, social, and cultural discrimination. The common denominator of the two problems is that the Arab workers must live in a hut or hovel on the outskirts of the Jewish towns, and the worker of the Sephardic community is packed into a crowded slum, unquote. We state that despite the ultra-nationalist policies of the State of Israel, uh, progressive programs of the Palestinian liberation movements are popularly supported by most Arab nations. In January 1969, Fatah spokesman Yasser Arafat stated, quote, our political vision for free Palestine is a democratic, secular, non-racial non state where all Palestinians, Christians, Jews, and Muslims will have equal rights, unquote. The Democratic Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine presented the following in a resolution introduced to the Palestinian, uh, to the Palestine National Congress in 1969, quote, the Palestine National Congress will struggle for a popular democratic Palestinian state where Arabs and Jews enjoy equal rights without discrimination, where all forms of national and class oppression shall be abolished, unquote. We state that the opposition of policies of Zionism all exist within Israel and among world Jewry. We, the following are excerpts from a thesis submitted for discussion to, is, to the Israeli Socialist Organization in 1966. Quote, Israel will be de-Zionized, i.e. all present laws and practices discriminating between Jews and non-Jews implementing Jewish supremacy will be abolished. Israel will adopt an anti-imperialist foreign policy, actively supporting the forces struggling for socialism and, and unification in the Arab world, unquote. We state that Israel supported the United States in the Korean War, aided France and the terrorist secret army organization in Algeria against the Algerian revolution, opposed anti-colonial anti independence movements in Morocco, Tunisia, Indonesia, and elsewhere, trained the counter-revolutionary para-commandos para of General Mobutu, who was one of the persons responsible for the murder of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, and presently provides arms and other equipment to the Portuguese troops fighting against the Angolan and Mozambican freedom fighters. We demand that all military aid or assistance of any kind to Israel must stop. Imperialism and Zionism must and will get out of the Middle East. We call for Afro-American solidarity with Palestinian people's struggle for national liberation and to regain 
all of their stolen land. So that uh, that was amazing, and that is of course sponsored by the Committee for Black Americans against uh, against United States support for the Zionist government of Israel. So we're going to have a discussion about the content of the of the statement. We're going to have a discussion with the people who actually signed it to talk about it. But I was wondering if I may, just to, um, before I turn it over to my sister Gail to introduce uh, our uh, some of our speakers, I just wanted to say I went through it and I wrote, if you don't mind, some of the names. There were 56 people who signed it. 15 of them were women. Uh, one of the discussion questions is, is why 56? Why not more? Why not less? What was happening? Who are the names who could be in it that were missing WhatsApp? But I wanted to mention the people who are in it that that be bring immediate recognition. In addition to our esteemed uh, participants here, Grace and James Lee Boggs from New York, from Detroit, Les Campbell, who was uh, of the East, a cultural organization at El Puente. He was a black teacher in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. He was targeted by Al Shanker, who targeted. Uh, the parents, which refers to what uh, Sam was talking about, of Ocean Hill Brownsville uh, battle and actually printed half a million flyers that were anti Semitic and distributed them as if they were actually from the black and Puerto Rican neighbors of Ocean Hill Brownsville. There is a new film documentary that's made by a couple of people who talk about this, who discuss it, uh, one, one black, one Jewish, actually. The next person is Dolores Cayo. And for me, that actually makes me so excited because I really didn't know until I looked at it because in, in uh, last year, last spring, uh, we attended a, a celebration of Dolores Cayo at San Francisco State, organized by one of my colleagues, Mark, Mark uh, Davis, and who is the head of the Racial Justice Council at San Francisco State in the faculty union. And, and then I found her name and she was the secretary of the Black Faculty Union at San Francisco State College at the time. And she is the founder of the dance program. And the honoring my colleagues did was because Dol Dolores Cayo was not actually recognized, but she had an amazing role all over Africa, teaching uh, kids how to dance and engaging in San Francisco and so on. So this is, it's really great. Another person is Reverend Albert Cleavid, Cleave, uh, Cleage, I think. And he was from the shrine of the Black Madonna. He hosted Malcolm X. When Malcolm X gave the speech, the ballot or the bullet. I mean, this is incredible. Ella Collins, the sister of uh, Malcolm X, and also from the Organization of African Unity. And she was actually like a mother to him. If you interview, watch her interviews and so on, she was more like a mother to him than, than just a sister. She was an older sister. Florence Kennedy, Flo Kennedy. Flo Kennedy was a leader of the Black Feminist Movement. She was a prominent lawyer. She passed away a couple of years ago, and she was actually very much involved with the uh, Kitchen Table Women of Color uh, Press, along with, the, um, 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 my God, Smith, Barbara Smith, who, who edited, you know, all these famous books and so on. All the women are black, all the men are white, but some of us are black and so on. I mean, this is, it's really incredible. And then there is Leonard, uh, Conrad Lynn, who was, a pro who was a prominent lawyer who actually uh, defended Lolita Lebron in New York, and there was also Robert Williams and his partner, uh, who uh, he defended actually, in, uh, uh, yeah, and he defended Robert Williams, he defended Etra Brown as well. So this is, you're talking about somebody who's, and then you're talking about Earl Ofari, writer, Afro-American Cultural Association from New York, William Petrie, Third World Solidarity Committee with Vietnam from Chicago, uh, B.R. Washington, who was a rank and file caucus member of the Transport Workers Union, in New York City, and of course, Robert F. Williams, who was a mentor to the Black Panther Party, uh, one, uh, the author of uh, Negroes uh, uh, with Guns in Detroit, and Maxine Williams, his partner, and also Gwendolyn Patton Weeds, who was co chair and former national coordinator for the National Association of Black Students in Washington, D.C. And these are just the people that I was kind of like able to research and recognize, but I think this is something, this statement is a topic for a PhD dissertation. So I think we want to, I mean, when, uh, the, the, to me, it's, it's really, really exciting. It's exciting to have 
um, all this, but it's also a question of kind of like, where were other people? How did this statement come about? A lot of the time we know, we look at a statement like, now I know why this Palestinian statement was signed by those folks, but not signed by other folks. And sometimes I think of it as a network analysis. I mean, especially if it's not published alphabetically, if it's published who signed first and so on, I'm like, aha, this is what happened. This is what the connection is going on and so on. So this is some of this statement. Unfortunately, it's mentioned, but it's not really analyzed. And I think the content of it is really incredible. So if we can actually maybe go now, uh, and if you don't mind, uh, my sister uh, Gail, if you want to kind of like, you know, start, with uh, uh, Phil Hutchins, Robert uh, Lerob, and uh, Sam Anderson to speak about that. And then we'll say a few words about uh, Fran Beal. And uh, she, you know, unfortunately is in the hospital. She just got admitted. She's ill, but she actually did speak to us. So we have some of the comments we can share and we can also get her on another time. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Gail, to introduce our uh, comments here, if you don't mind. Yeah. Very good. Great. Thank you. That um, I've learned a lot. And thank you, Sam, for, for sharing that document. I think it's, um, as you just mentioned, um, uh, Rabab, it's such a historic, uh, historically rich, um, an amazing statement written in 1970, but yet not really um, surprising given the radical climate, uh, especially uh, in the country, especially uh, uh, within the, uh, the black and brown communities. But what a powerful statement. So thank you for that. Uh, we are just honored to have uh, uh, several of the signers of the document with us. Uh, we're gonna start out um, with um, Phil Hutchins, uh, who was uh, born in 1942 in Cleveland, Ohio, um, attended Howard University and worked in education and nonprofit. Movement. He was a civil rights activist, uh, continues to be, uh, and a uh, member, I believe, the chair of the of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Newark, Jersey, uh, and one of the signers of the document. So we're going to ask um, Phil Hutchins to join us. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. I just wanted to say that it was really great hearing Sam read the statement. Um, I hadn't heard it that, or read it in quite a few years. And um, it was, I mean, it's remarkable hearing that and, and thinking about the many people who signed it and, and people who, and the struggles that they came out of. And um, I had been a member of SNCC and I think what brought me to it was, learning in SNCC, working with grassroots people and in, in the South and um, dealing with state violence, uh, which was basically through the state legislatures, the police forces and um, different uh, juries and just daily life under what was called Jim Crow uh, segregation, uh, what poor, poor oppressed people go through. And I think I say that because it encompasses a lot of the people who I knew in SNCC, who when we heard about Palestine or other struggles around the world is that uh, we began to understand it more than simply a, a document. We understood what were some of the struggles that people were going through. What was the, the best struggle? And uh, it was, our growing awareness. I mean, we started out as a group working in the U.S. South, pretty much year around the uh, political struggles of the United States, the Southern United States. And increasingly, we had growing awareness of things outside the United States, which had impact on people everywhere, and particularly poor and oppressed people everywhere. So as some of our people went to Africa and Southern Africa, West Africa, to learn about the growing independent struggles that um, we began to get a sense of internationalism. And SNCC had an international affairs office in New York City, which was led by the, uh, the late Jim Foreman, and who was one of the key people in pushing us to have an international consciousness. 
and that's what would was the basis of, of, of having a, revol a real revolutionary consciousness, not just for your own people, not just for your own struggle, but basically how these struggles mix and, and very frequently had the same opponents uh, working behind the scenes or more directly against people rising up to get their own rights and for national sovereignty of different nations. So uh, I guess for me personally, uh, and this is where I will bring in Algeria, uh, I think that uh, I became aware of the Arab world in the, as a high school student and, um, and in Cleveland, Ohio, and um, dealing with uh, liberal people, J Jews and other folks who um, basically were on this question not so liberal. I mean, they were liberal, I, and I saw this even more when I lived in New York, is that you had people who were very liberal on most issues of the day in, in dealing in US politics, but somehow they basically raised the question of Israel and attaching that as part of trying to make that part of the agenda. So um, it's through that growing awareness and trips to Africa, uh, trips to Cuba, and going through the struggle of the 70s, which uh, I think uh, really has to think of the role that many of us played in the anti-war mo war movement against the U.S. war in Vietnam, which in many ways was the key international struggle of the 1970s. Uh, Vietnam will win and fighting to make that happen. And the role of Vietnam having a major political impact in us and, and, and when I first went to Cuba in 1970, um, Vietnam was talking about Vietnam and the role that Vietnam was playing internationally against US imperialism and the struggle for peoples in Africa, Asia, other parts of Latin America became a sense of how people could unite. And we needed doc statements, documents, physical presentations of solidarity uh, with people because uh, in the United States, the mainstream press was not gonna give us that type of understanding or even recognition. So he said, in, in many ways, the context for, that, for the statement comes for me out of that and trying to uh, demystify both the role of so-called US democracy and, um, and that it, realizing it once you experience people who lived under governments which had received quote aid or support from the US or, or attacks by the US military, that the US, US was not so democratic. And so that we had to broaden the thrust of our struggle in, in, beyond the South of the United States and to basically deal with what was happening internationally. And um, that's continued. And uh, I, I find it great that looking at that now, 50 years later uh, or more, is that we are still struggling here in the United States, African-Americans. This year, particularly 2020, was a major year of black struggle all over the country. And, um, and um, we feel that, we brought in more allies, but we also increased our support among people, other peoples of color in the United States and internationally. And that has continued. And at the same time, 50 years later, we see our brothers and sisters in Palestine still suffering, still fighting, still struggling. And it's really great when the struggles can, can come together and, and support each other. I mean, I remember back during the time of Occupy Oakland, in uh, an earlier part of the, this century, when uh, we were struggling and we saw that the Palestinians in Gaza had raised a banner saying, Occupy Oakland, supporting Occupy Oakland. And to me, that was a great symbol of Palestinians supporting what we were doing in, in the United States. And um, that happened again uh, in other places around Gaza, the, the struggle in Gaza where uh, North American and particularly African-American activists and organizations supported um, the thrust of what was happening in, in Gaza uh, for the right of people in, in Palestine to be sovereign and independent. 
and um, and we felt that was what we were supposed to be doing. It wasn't like we had it was any effort to do that. It was basically an accentuation of our politics, which we which was basically our lived politics in the struggle, and um, we basically support the fact that uh, uh, the Palestinians are continuing the struggle and, and we could continue the struggle with them. And I would just say, personally, as somebody who feels I'm part of what gets so-called sometimes the black radical tradition in the United States, that it's uh, the goal to support all these struggles that are fighting against imperialism, colonialism, and um, external domination, and that um, uh, we will, I mean, we will have each other's back in the struggle, and that um, as, as, you, as the Palestinians struggle, in their struggle, and our struggle, that they will come together, and we have a great role and responsible in fighting, and basically fighting the Zionist movement in the United States which basically has found what tries to find ways to divide and conquer progressive movements, divide and conquer the black movement and, and, and keep blacks and Palestinians from working together. And, um, and, uh, and we pledge ourselves to do that and continue that struggle. And uh, we believe that in the long run, like Vietnam, Palestine will win. And, uh, and it's our role to make that happen. And I think it's really important that People in, in Palestine know that there are African Americans and, and, and a widening group of people who basically see their responsibility in the United States to keep the struggle of Palestine uh, visible, active, and making as many possible alliances with between the Black and the Palestinian community in the United States uh, as possible and struggle. To the, to the final end of Palestinian sovereignty, I'm sorry, Palestinian independence and sovereignty. And uh, I wanna thank you for giving me the chance to do that, say this, and uh, that I think the, the statement that Sam read in that time period of 1970 has, was really a key point. And, and, I, and I keep thinking of ways that we need to keep light shining on Palestine and also building alliances, which is what I've been doing with SNCC and other groups most of my political life. Thank you. And thank you, Brother Phil. I, th I know we have tons of questions for you because we also know a lot of stuff about your oral history, so we will come back to that. And we're also going to be uh, showing some of the images of what SNCC statement was, you know, the, the, the one that you published and so on. Uh, but uh, we, I'm gonna pass it over to Gail to also continue to, uh, to oh yeah, maybe we can we can share those in uh, this, the picture. Maybe uh, you want to like, maybe we can go back to, to Ambassador Robert next. Go ahead, please. Sure, yeah. oops. Sorry, I am, okay, I've unmuted myself. Um, yeah, very, um, again, rich history. And I look forward to some of the images that we'll be able to uh, pull together shortly. But um, moving along for now, um, next we're going to hear from um, uh, another uh, very key person in this uh, movement, um, Robert F. Um, uh, Lero. Uh, who uh, has a varied and distinguished uh, career, uh, which included, you know, stints as the assistant legal counsel at the NAACP in the late 1960s, as ambassador to the United Nations uh, for the Republic of uh, Vanuatu, uh, as a journalist and film producer, uh, as a founding partner in the law firm of uh, Van uh, Lirup. Burns and Bassett at the United Nations during the 1980s. He was influential in negotiating on important global issues, including the ending of apartheid in South Africa and on international environmental law. He was the vice president of the United Nations General Assembly in its 43rd session and chair of the fourth committee, which is the trusteeship and decolonization committee during the 44th session 
of the General Assembly and Vice Chair of the Ad Hoc Committee of the Whole during the 16th Special Session on the United Nations General Assembly on Apartheid and its destructive consequences in Southern Africa. He's also uh, served as the first chairman of the Alliance of Small Island Nations from 1991 to 1994. So we are very honored to have the ambassador with us and uh, ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gail. You're welcome. Can everyone hear me? Um, did I do something wrong? Uh, so are you, we can, right? we can hear you. you hear me? Okay, good. We'll see you when we hear good. you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gail. And uh, greetings, greetings through you to your late dad, who uh, did a great deal to support uh, many, many of the uh, pieces of work that I was fortunate to be involved in. Uh, Lucius Walker was a, was a giant, was a giant. He, he is still a giant in my opinion. Um, I'd like to also uh, acknowledge the role of Paul Boutel, uh, who was my, uh, this is really ironic. Paul Boutel's father and my father grew up together in Suriname and uh, were big buddies uh, in the uh, anti-colonial movement in Suriname. Uh, and when uh, Paul and I became great friends, uh, he was a member of the Socialist Workers Party uh, and, and very proud to be a Trotskyite. Uh, I never was a Trotskyite, but uh, many people thought I was because of uh, my friendship with uh, Paul Boutel. But a lot of people made a, a great many mistakes. But Paul was the person who suggested to me that we sign this uh, statement, the declaration. Uh, in September of 1970 that appeared in the New York Times. And uh, Paul was also a person who introduced me to uh, people like uh, George Habash and uh, Nayef Hawatme and uh, other leaders of the Palestinian res resistance. And uh, once when I was practicing law, uh, with the firm Fleischer, Dawn Bush, Mention, Mandelstam, uh, a partner in the law firm, the daughter of a partner in the law firm, was uh, on a TWA flight that was hijacked uh, into the desert in Jordan. And uh, I was asked to uh, bring him there uh, because they wanted to release her. And as a matter of fact, something that a lot of people don't remember is that uh, the Palestinians who hijacked the flight said that they wanted to release Barbara Mensch and that they were going to challenge the US government to release Angela Davis at that time. And uh, of course, the US did not release Angela Davis, but uh, Marty Mensch, her father, and I did travel to uh, Jordan and then to the uh, Palestinian camps. And uh, ironically, the New York Post, uh, who Mr. Trump never refers to as fake news, uh, wrote an article saying that uh, she was my girlfriend and that I went with her father uh, to negotiate her release. Uh, first of all, she was a, a, a small child. I had never met her, but she was uh, 16 years old at the time. So I don't think that uh, she would have ever, ever had a boyfriend of my age uh, at that time. But uh, Barbara, when she was released, told stories of how the uh, hijackers uh, had risked their lives to make sure that uh, there was a rabbi who was also on the flight, that uh, he had kosher food. He wanted kosher food. And in fact, one or two of them were actually killed by the Jordanian military uh, because they went out 
searching for kosher food for her. And that's another bit of humanitarianism that has never been discussed. Uh, the Palestinians were always, always very, very humanitarian, uh, very focused on the struggle and always full of solidarity with other oppressed people. Uh, so um, this signing the statement in September of 1970, uh, that was an easy decision to make. As a matter of fact, if asked why we signed it, our response was, why wouldn't we? And uh, why would others not sign it? Um, Sam Anderson, I've known for a good many years, a good many years, since he was one of the four leaders uh, who seized the office, uh, uh, occupied the office of the president of Columbia University uh, in support of progressive courses, progressive causes. Uh, Sam Anderson, Bill Sales, uh, Andy Newman, Cicero Wilson, those were the four members of the steering committee for those student activists who continued to be activists uh, at, after the occupation of Columbia was ended. The, did I get those, that right, Sam? I, I, I was... Um... An outsider. I was not a student at. <laughs> I was not a student at Columbia. I was one of the quote unquote community folk. So I was the outsider. So formally, Sam, you it, have never been an outsider. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been called an outside agitator, but you were never an outsider. You may not have been enrolled at Columbia University, but there's no way that Sam Anderson was ever an outsider. And I, I know Amen. That, Amen. I don't know about Cicero. And uh, Andy, I don't know where they are now, but I know that if Bill, if Bill Sales were here, he would say he would be shocked and he would say outsider, Sam Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> no way. No way. I, I, I'm sorry to just interrupt for a minute, Ambassador. It's also the same story with San Francisco State. So San Francisco State, it was students, uh, Black Student Union, Third World Liberation Front that led the strike. But one of the members of the delegation, the, the U.S. Uh, Prisoner Solidarity Delegation, the first one we did in 2016 was Hank Jones. And Hank was telling us actually in Palestine afterwards that he went from the south right to, to San Francisco and he was one of the community organizers. So when you talk mm -hmm. about Sam Anderson, quote unquote insider, that's the way Hank would say, oh, I wasn't actually a student at San Francisco State. But then when you talk to all the strikers and when there was the 50th anniversary of that Black Panther party and we were meeting with everybody, everybody was whatever he says, everybody listens to because he was one of the organizers, one of the leaders. So there is always this kind of relationship yes. between university and, and community that I'm really, really grateful that you're, I'm sorry for yeah. the interruption. And I'm glad that Sam brought us together. And Sam, finally, I'll tell you that the only outsider I know of is named Mr. Trump. And uh, he is definitely an outside agitator. Uh, you're an, uh, an unenrolled brother, but not an outsider, not at all. Uh, unenrolled at Columbia at that time. But uh, anyway, Paul Boutel, uh, said that we should really get on board and sign and support this statement. And uh, we did. And uh, when I went with Marty Mensch to uh, get his daughter uh, released, there was no negotiation. I didn't have to negotiate anything. Uh, they said they wanted to do that, to release her in solidarity with the black people people in this country. And that was when they issued the challenge to the United States to release Angela Davis at the same time. And they, they knew, we knew that the U.S. was not about to release Angela Davis uh, at that time. Um, so uh, I could not be prouder than to have signed that statement and to be a longtime supporter of the Palestinian resistance. And uh, resistance is exactly what it is, because uh, the way the Palestinian people have been treated, the way their land was stolen, 
the way their culture was suppressed or attempted to be suppressed and uh, the way that uh, they always, always stood tall with uh, oppressed people in other parts of the world. And another uh, piece of serendipity was that when I was getting ready to go to Mozambique to make the documentary on uh, the independence movement in Mozambique, Verda May Grosvenor, you remember her? Verda May Grosvenor introduced me to Bob Fletcher because I had said to Verda May, I needed to find a good camera person, uh, someone who had experience with this kind of thing. And of course, there was no one who had experience with this kind of thing, but she referred me to Bob Fletcher, who was a SNCC photographer. And Bob used to always tell me uh, stories about how when working in the South, he used to carry his cameras over his shoulder. And when they had encountered uh, encounters with the proud boys of that day, that Bob would take his cameras off of his shoulder and swing them as uh, weapons of self-defense. And I said to myself, oh boy, this, this guy has got to come with me. I've got, got to have him. And Bob is today a lawyer uh, in Florida. Uh, and we still are in touch. We're still good friends. We made two films in Mozambique on the revolution. And uh, Lucius Walker was one of our big supporters of those films. And uh, it's, it's just so amazing. I'm sorry that Paul Boutel is no longer with us, but uh, his spirit lingers. And many people in Palestine knew Paul and still love and respect him. Um, I should probably end now because uh, other people might have more to add and contribute to this. Uh, my role was really relatively small, but uh, my heart has always been with the people of Palestine and always will be with the people of Palestine, always. Thank you. Thaura Hattanasar. Your Arabic is really good. <laughs> Shokran. <laughs> we'll come back, we'll come back, because this is very interesting about the hijacking, especially since the censoring of our webinar, but mm, we'll come back yeah. to that. Maybe and tell, yeah, believe yeah. me, wanna... that, that story <laughs> that I was yeah. going to get my quote-unquote girlfriend that appeared in the New York Post, that didn't go down too well with my girlfriend. <laughs> 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 At the time, who... Yeah. I never even knew where I went because I just disappeared one Friday and uh, she never knew where I was until we returned maybe three or four weeks later. Wow. 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 Well, well we're going we're gonna to have a lot of questions for you as well, but, you know, we want to also hear from Sam next. So okay. back to you, Gail. Yes. Again, an important reason, uh, Dr. Abdulhali, to have these, this open classroom. I mean, we're all learning so much. I know I'm just so pleased to be here. So thank you so much, Ambassador. Next, we want to hear from our dear friend, uh, uh, Sam Anderson. Dr. Sam Anderson is uh, from Brooklyn, New York. He's a native and founding member of the Coalition for Public Education and the National Black Education Agenda. He's the author of several books and essays on science, technology, and the history of slavery. Among them, The Third World Confronts Science and Technology and The Black Holocaust for Beginners. Excellent read. He is an uh, editor at Black Dialogue, Noble Journal, and The Black uh, Activist. He was the first chair of the Black Studies Department from 1969 to 1970 at Sarah Lawrence College and taught mathematics, science, and Black history at SUNY Old Westbury uh, City College of New York, New York University, Rutgers University and Brooklyn College. He has been active in the civil rights and black liberation movement since 1964 as a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, the Black Panther Party and the Black Reparations Movement. And you can find many of his writings at blackeducator.org. 
Sam Anderson, we're pleased to have you and you now have the floor. Uh, thank you. And a good uh, um, evening, afternoon, morning again um, to everybody uh, who's, who's listening. Um, we hope to get uh, people engaged in some questions and so forth. It's very, very important that we uh, c carry on the legacy of struggle from uh, what was going on 50 years ago. The context in which um, we organized this um, letter, um, not letter, but, but statement, was uh, coming out of uh, a, a period of 1969, 1970, 1968, 1969, 1970, which were very, very tumultuous times. Every day there was something going on um, in terms of actions in any part of the world. And uh, the Black Liberation Movement was um, ascending, I, I would say, in this period. Uh, this period um, showed a, a burst of demand for uh, Black Studies programs all across the country. And um, they became intellectual centers fairly quickly. Um, uh, San Francisco State was one, uh, and then there were a couple others in other places. And by 1969, students at Sarah Lawrence College demanded uh, a black studies program, and um, uh, I, 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 I subsequently was was hired as the chair of the program and also teaching um, uh, a, a math course uh, in, in, while doing the, the chair work. And um, it uh, under the context is that Sarah Lauren was and is a very liberal college, but when it came to the issue of Zionism, it was liberalism went out, went out the window. Um, uh, my signing on to the statement meant that um, I subsequently, make a long story short, was, my job was relegated to one day. Uh, and the president at the time was DiCarlo, and he understood that if he offered me a one day job, that I would not take that job. And <laughs> that was an insult. So the, rather than go through the legal ramifications of, of, of uh, firing somebody, uh, that's the way they, they made the offer. So um, that was one. The other factor in, in which um, uh, uh, Sister Rabab had, had raised is where are the other people in the radical black academic, academic world uh, on this document? And that was a challenge. My, you know, I was a very young person at that point. I assume that if you were black and engaged in um, talking radical stuff that, and, and on a campus, that you would sign on to this. But time and time again, when we made phone calls or wrote letters to people, either you know, to, 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 to show them, to send them the document, um, we we would not get a response. We would not get a response from many, many other people. Uh, and so hence, we see the paucity of university-based um, uh, Black faculty members who were supposed to be, um, quote unquote, radical uh, because of the pressure that they would face um, for signing on to an anti-Zionist statement and a pro-Palestinian statement. And, and so that, that's a lesson that we learned um, uh, coming out in this period, that um, you know, your 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 salary could be um, axed in 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 a matter of uh, one or two sentences by by the powers that be, and people did not want that to happen to them. So so they rather than respond to us, they did no, a no response, and so um, years later. Um, some people uh, became more outspoken and progressive and took that stance in, in terms of um, uh, supporting the Palestinian struggle. But the vast majority have shied away from that, retired, shied away from, from being involved in that. So that's a, that, that shows you how powerful the Zionist uh, forces are in, in collaboration with the domestic uh, uh, imperialist powers in, in, in the United States. 
how powerful that was in, in, in helping to shape a, an aspect of the radical black intellectual uh, 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 movement, if you will, in, in the United States. The, the, the litmus test, in other words, was whether or not you support the Palestinian struggle and that you would do that publicly. Privately, you do it, but do it publicly. You know, that, that, was, that, that was the issue at that point. Um, it, the, the other challenge was uh, raising money to get this ad placed um, in the Times. Uh, and fortunately, uh, in this period of 1969, 1970, a full page or, or half page ad or so in the New York Times wasn't as ridiculously expensive as it is today. And so we, you know, we, we dug into our own pockets and we got other people who, who supported it to, to give us money anonymously and so forth. But, you know, it, it wasn't prohibitive. And so it, that's one of the reasons why it, it did, in fact, get into the uh, publication of, of the New York Times. Um, we, we were, the responses were uh, very uh, swift. Um, for, for that period, remember now, we're talking a period where there was no email, no internet, um, but within a matter of a day or two, we, 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 were, we were, were, were getting responses, uh, many positive responses uh, from the piece. Um, and and it, it, it was uh, such that the president of Sarah Lawrence, DiCarlo, uh, felt he was obligated to to, to send a letter to the editor of the New York Times stating that Sarah Lawrence College had nothing to do with, with this, this document and that, that, that they supported um, Israel and so forth and so on down the line. Um, that's how frightened he was of losing money uh, because of um, my uh, signage. I signed uh, as, as, you know, Sarah, you know at Sarah Lawrence College. Um, but it was only by for affiliation reasons, no, uh, 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 only. It's not by, you know, uh, this is a, a, a statement that is supported by the institution that I work at. Uh, anyway, that um, document um, has a link to the SNCC document, which um, Sister Rabab had mentioned, and uh, I believe it's um, online. Uh, one of our one of our links to the SNCC document that came out in 1967 um, that also had devastating effects with SNCC and Phil brother Phil can talk about that. But I I I was I happened to be in the SNCC fundraising office uh, in '67 in New York City at the time, uh, which was located at 105th Avenue, uh, an office donated to us by. Uh, what we found out later was the Zionist. Um, and once SNCC came out with the statement in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle uh, uh, that summer, um, the landlord called in and Fran Beal, unfortunately Fran is not with us, she also would be able to give you the details, but she, I think she was the one that, that received the call, but I know she was in the office at the time. He said, you have 24 hours to get out of this office <laughs> just to shut down the, the, the fundraising office 24 hours. You know, get all your stuff, get out. And I believe Nick lost somewhere in the vicinity of 85 to 90 percent of its financial base from coming out with that statement. Brother Phil can uh, uh, probably uh, fill us in on, on that in more details. But, th but that was 67. So three years later, um, the Palestinian struggle is still uh, going on, and, and, we, and we felt that it was important that we, we come up with an a, a upgraded, updated statement um, uh, for um, the public to know how many uh, African Americans stand uh, with Palestine and not with Zionist Israel. So, so that, that's that's. That's leading us up to 1970, which that statement in turn um, uh, dealt with um, 
uh, a number of other things within, particularly within New York City, um, uh, in, 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 in developing even a, a tighter solidarity with the, with the Palestinian forces, trying to get um, uh, public space for the PLO to speak in Harlem. Uh, that did happen. Uh, get solidarity, you know, over the years in the 70s and so forth. Um, all of those things uh, uh, did happen. So, so that the, the lineage in terms of Palestinian solidarity predates that 1970 statement, predates that 1967 statement from SNCC, goes back uh, to the time of Brother Malcolm and, and uh, uh, his efforts to um, uh, publicly speak about the plight of Palestinian people and, and, and him formally meeting and informally meeting with uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization representatives at the UN uh, before his assassination. Uh, so, so there is this, this, this legacy that's carried on and that there are individuals uh, who, who are, um, were with Malcolm in SNCC and, 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 and in the 1970s who uh, helped to carry, physically, mentally, helped to carry that, that legacy on. I'll stop here, and I know that there'll probably be a lot of questions that we can get into. Now, there is a lot, Sam, because there is all your history with the Black Panthers and everything else that we would want to talk about. Uh, as uh, we said that, uh, you know, um, do you want to introduce uh, Frank here, and I can just like mention some of the things that she said, but we also can talk to her later and add this to the, you know. Sure, sure. No, I think that's that's important to do. And um, again, thank you, thank you, Sam. I look forward to these uh, the Q and A section. But um, the uh, uh, Rabab mentioned we unfortunately. Um, uh, cannot be joined by uh, uh, Fran Bill, Francis M. Beal. Um, uh, she's um, uh, not uh, w well under the weather, but um, uh, we had planned on having her. She's a longtime peace and justice black feminist, best known for her seminal essay, Double Jeopardy, to be black and female. She started her activism with SNCC, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and continued in the Third World Women's Alliance a prolific writer on black politics, peace, and gender equality. Writings, her writings have appeared in Black Scholar, Frontline News, Line of March, San Francisco Bayview, The Examiner, and other online platforms. She's now retired and living in Oakland, California. Um, so yeah, it would be wonderful to hear some of the um, the commentary that uh, she shared with with you. Um, yeah, she she shared some of the stuff with us. We were really hoping for for Brand to be Brand to be here because she's so prolific and she has so much uh, uh, stuff to say. And as Sam said, she she was in the in the question. She was actually in that office when Snick received the notice that you need to clean out. You need to get evicted which uh, also speaks about the many losses. And so what Fran was, some of the stuff, um, I can't actually be Fran, I'm just going to mention some of the things she told us. She said that she actually became politicized because that was one of the questions we asked everybody. How did you get to be to the point that you actually signed the statement? Nobody just wakes up and decides I'm going to sign the statement. And uh, Sam raised questions about uh, where were the people? And it's really interesting to kind of not to not to uh, out people or not to guilt trip them or whatever, but would be really interesting to go back and see the people who did not sign at the time who were afraid because of the chilling effect and so on. Where are they now? What is it that they are doing? How have they moved? Because I do know like a lot of people have moved from our reading of history. We all know that. So Fran said that she became politicized actually in the 60, 61, uh, and she was an, uh, as part of Students for Africa. She was studying in France. She was a student at the Sorbonne, and she, and also, by the way, I think Phil also mentioned that as well, the first Palestinian they met was an Algerian. Very interesting, right? And this is, I think this is also the same thing that I think, uh, Sam, you you can speak about that, is how, how did this come about? But she met Algerian students in France, and this was before the liberation of Algeria. This was still what was Algeria was colonized. 
and uh, she got she became very friendly with people from the NLF, the National Liberation Front uh, for the Liberation of Algeria. People have seen the Battle of Algiers. It actually dramatizes it and so on. But there's a lot of writings about that. And uh, she we used to go to a bookstore. That was uh, and she re and she will read. This is how she learned about this first. And that's how she developed her anti-colonial, anti-imperialist consciousness that later led her on. She met Arab students in a cafe in France. She became very active with them. Then she came back to the U.S. And then uh, she was in, uh, in uh, SNCC and she was she spoke to James Foreman, who uh, introduced her to the international affairs because she also spoke uh, French. She could also translate and so on. So she became very active and she became very active with multiple things and she says that she was a mississippi delegate and of course she she actually refers to it i think there was one question about Bayard dresden which is a really an important discussion we need to talk about is that uh, she uh, she felt that uh, he was very he played a very conservative role in the in the black community and then well Bayard Rustin, we know that he was not really supportive of union movement and his his agenda was uh, and other issues also, sort of like um, left to the to the to the mainstream and so on. Pe more people can speak about that. But uh, Bayard Dresden was pushing in 1967 for black leaders to support Israel, and uh, but uh, but a lot of black uh, people and black leaders and black activists had a serious problem because of Vietnam and because of Israel's role in Vietnam, which was also mentioned in the statement and also. In addition, I mean, this is there is a very low, very very big com connection, and Palestinians, as as a matter of fact, make a very big connection between the whole question of Vietnam fighting against the U.S., the U.S. being imperial power, Palestinians being very much influenced by many black uh, activists like Muhammad Ali, who refused to go fight in Vietnam. So people kind of like also relate and learn about what does it mean. Also, at the same time, there was also Palestinians where you know you don't really want to go fight in the Israeli military against the Palestinians. So there is this connection, which you also make in the statement. But she said also that it's really important that to keep in mind that this is uh, support with Palestine is not something new for the black community. She said, actually, there was a massive movement in 1898 when the U.S. colonized Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam and other places. Actually, there was a very, very big movement, black movement opposing that. She talked about the whole question about how uh, the black community was very supportive of uh, of Cuba. And I think this is something that you can speak about that, Sam, and also your partner, uh, Dr. Rosemary Mealy, wrote a book about Fidel and and uh, and, uh, and Malcolm X. My, I'm not going to steal your thunder, so I'm just mentioning some of the stuff, connecting some of the dots. She said that as a black, and also one of the things that Fran spoke about, about being half Jewish. Fran, uh, Fran is half Jewish have black and many people were always come to her and say well you know you should really be supporting israel and she's no i don't want to support israel because of my not because i'm i'm, I'm black but because of my anti-colonial my anti-international perspectives and so on so she spoke about that and she said that one of the people that she met which i really didn't know but she said one of the people that she really met and was very much influenced with was a woman named georgette ayub who was half palestinian half lebanese and she was and I didn't know that because I met Georgette in Cairo when I was teaching at the, in Cairo from 2000, 2001. I met Georgette and we were working with each other and so on. But I really never knew that Georgette was very influential in the National Alliance of uh, um, you know, Third World Women, that, uh, that Fran. And so Fran said that actually Georgette was the one who trained me and taught me everything about Palestine. So she mentioned a lot of things that I'm, I, I don't want to take, take all of it because once, hopefully when... When France is out of the, uh, the hospital and she's feeling better and so on, we should actually have that and have France speak for herself and her own activism. Oh, then she did speak about one thing else, about uh, that she was a secretary at one point for the National uh, Council for Negro Women and uh, Healy. I think Healy was the head of it at the time. And France was uh, was talking about how Healy was being, um, Hel Hel Healy, I think, was being uh, pressured day in and day out to sign that statement pro-Israel. And she will, a lot of the time, say she's not available, she's not there, tell them I'm not here, I'm not going to take the call, and so on. But eventually they had her sign one, but then she she said it was really amazing how he really managed to not sign any more statements about uh, about Israel. So I think 
what what Fran brought up here, which we can discuss, is the whole question of Bayer Dresden's role as somebody who actually worked very closely with Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and but actually took the position of being pro-Israel. And the whole question about the claim that a lot of uh, um, uh, Jews who are supported the civil rights movement were Zionists. And by the way, there aren't really claims. There are, there isn't, there isn't, it's a claim. It's not really, there isn't foundation about that. There's some were supportive, some were not supportive. Uh, she also spoke about how the, the, the pressure to it. And we also, like last time we talked about um, the ways in which there is this supposedly letter going around that Martin Luther King wrote to an anti-Zionist friend telling him change. And it turns out there is no such letter. It doesn't really exist. Actually, and now the Zionist press admitted finally that there is no such letter. There is rumors that there was a letter. So there is a lot of these, the, a lot of these kind of um, uh, stories that are that are being circulated and so on to to speak about uh, the, the 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 Jewish support for the civil rights movement, including the two young Jewish men who were martyred when they were part of Freedom Summer and so on. And so the, the, the claim is to talk about it as if this was, this Jewish presence was supportive of Israel. But there is no basis to actually make that argument because historically, people who participated in the civil rights movement and, and in black liberation and support and so on, participated on the basis of being anti-slavery, anti-colonialism, support of liberation and so on. It wasn't necessarily in support of Israel per se, but that is something that we actually should talk about because I think that also requires some demystification, aside from the discussion about, and maybe Gail, you can speak about that, the way some people say this is because in the black church, and then they say the church as if there is one church, and there is one black, and there is one history. I mean, it's also, even in that sense, it's very problematic. The black church always talks about uh -huh. Zion, talks about uh, Israel, and so on, but it's actually about a particular church. So I think this is all these discussions, we can actually bring them up, because, you know, uh, your father, um, there is a lot of actually, I knew a lot of people in Harlem who, Father Lucas, a whole bunch of people were actually, uh -huh. and I mean, that's how I met them. I met them because we used to go to Harlem all the time, get invited to go and speak about Palestine. So if they were so much pro Israel and pro Zionist, how would they invite us? That, that, that doesn't really make sense. Uh -huh. So I think this is, there are issues that actually we need to disentangle and decipher in, in our discussion. And so I'm going to stop here so we can talk about you know, the various things around the statement and so on. And I would really, I would like to also talk about the statement when when we, the statement itself, before we open it up uh, for mm -hmm. discussion. So I'm going to throw it back at you, Gail, and then we can also talk with our, you know, just have a conversation with our with our uh, participants, with our panelists. Yeah. And Salim and Anais, feel free whenever you want to jump in and you say something too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll just, just very briefly, I think that you make a very good point about this. Um, yeah, the black community not being a monolithic community, the faith community not being monolithic. And too often, you know, there are just um, these incredible sweeping claims that get made. Um, uh, and they're all uh, uh, trying to sort of, I think, connect um, with um, that uh, Zionist uh, p position. You know, I, there was a... Um, a uh, op-ed piece that was written several years ago by, uh, well, a couple years ago by Michelle Alexander, uh, talking about making the con the, the connection uh, for herself personally between um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's visit to Riverside Church and his speaking out against Vietnam, and she paralleled that with her, you know, her commitment to to stand up and speak out. Uh, uh, against um, the uh, the horrific uh, treatment of our Palestinian family, and um, it you know we're reminded of this time and time again. As Sam was talking about all of the pressures that have been put on um, you know uh, organizations, um, you know individuals, uh, colleges, universities uh, to uh, uh, take a um, a pro-Israeli position. Uh, for fear of losing jobs, tenure in the case of Sam, uh, money, um, and that that was the kind of pressure that continues, that was, I think, very much um, uh, in play and continues to be uh, in play. And um, so it's it's interesting when you think about the ways that uh, the various institutions um, are really um, um, intimidated, uh, how that continues to absolutely be the case, never mind um, uh, mainstream uh, politics when we think about APAC and all of those, you know, the, the, the Zionist lobby and, um, and that kind of, uh, uh, 
that kind of strangulation. I'll just quickly say that one of the things that, you know, and that IFCO ran into when we, um, you know, were our 501c3, our tax exempt status was um, threatened and then eventually taken away, was that we were attacked by um, the um, so called liberal, you know, Democrats and the Tea Party. I mean, and they were hand in glove, you know, with their attack on, on IFCO saying, how could this organization have um, tax exempt status and be supporting the people of Palestine? Of course, they didn't put it that way. They supporting terrorism, because of course they've got to equate it with uh, these nefarious claims. But I'm sorry, can you, can you hear me? There's something that I want to add. Please, please, important. I can, we can hear you, please do. Okay, all right. Um, all of this, uh, propaganda that was put out about uh, Zionist support for the civil rights movement. Let's not forget that one of the important, important issues was Israel's relations with South Africa and the apartheid regime and the role that Israeli intelligence and Israeli military advisors played yes. in supporting apartheid. So there was never any question in the minds of people who were involved in the Southern African liberation movements that uh, Israel was one of the enemies, one of the enemies of the anti-apartheid movement. And that superseded for every, for every person that said uh, we must support Israel uh, because it supports the civil rights movement, because Jewish citizens support the civil rights movement. There were 20 people who pointed out rightfully that Israel was one of the biggest supporters of South Africa and Rhodesia, and one of those who prolonged the apartheid mm -hmm. regime's existence. Um, so we, we mustn't forget that. Um, Can I that add something about South up. Africa? And yeah. I wanted. To... Oh no, I'm, I'm not. You're not finished when you finish. I wanted to ask something about Southern Africa. Yeah, and I wanted to suggest I wanted to suggest that one of the people uh, that can be contacted about SNCC and its history with respect to uh, the the uh, the struggle is Fanny Rushing in Chicago. Sam knows her. Uh, she worked in SNCC for a good many years, and she's now running the the uh, the SNCC history wow. project, and she's got a wealth of information. And as a matter of fact. The next time you have a program like this, you might want to contact Fanny and see if she would be uh, available. And finally, finally, the, my last word is that uh, there was a very interesting thing that happened when I traveled with uh, Marty Mensch to uh, get his daughter, Barbara, who was, as I said, only 16 years old. Every stop we made, Marty and I, on our journey, uh, we were met by, or he was met by uh, FBI and CIA people who kept telling him that it was a trap, that uh, in fact, I was working for the Palestinians and my task was to deliver Marty Mensch to the Palestinians. He was a very wealthy man, very wealthy and an expert in uh, certain aspects of the law and that I was to deliver him to the Palestinians because he was much more valuable as a hostage than his his 16 year old daughter was. Wow. And uh, can you say I, more about this, uh, Robert? Can you say more about that? Because you spoke very very quickly. Because one of the things that has happened last month, our webinar was censored by Zoom and then by Facebook and YouTube because one of our guests was Leila Khaled, and the Zionist uh, groups basically kept saying she was. She was one of the hijackers. She was. She was not. She. I don't think she was the hijacker of that plane, the TWA. I think it was another one. This is one of them, right? She wasn't on that plane with Leila, well, but she was. was Mensch, I'm saying Barbara, but can you speak a little bit more about that because they're making very big deal out of it. How Palestinians were terrorists were doing all of. So if you can clarify, yes. it, it would be really great. If you don't know. Yes, they did do that. They did do that, and as a matter of fact. Uh, at one point, I said to Marty as we were traveling, I said, you're very brave and courageous to, to make this journey. 
with me of all people because uh you know you're being warned that uh, i'm in on it and that uh my job is to turn you over to the palestinians and they don't have to hijack anything else just just deliver you to them and uh he said that you know he was going to tell me why that he wasn't so brave and why he was going on this journey with me and uh i said go ahead what is it and he said you've never been married to a jewish mother have you uh and i said no <laughs> no i laughed but he said that that was why he had to go uh to get his daughter um and as a matter of fact when we came back and his daughter was talking about the palestinians who were killed getting kosher food for the rabbi uh the New York Post ran that story once and then they stopped running it and they stopped interviewing her because she came out supporting the Palestinians. After her experience, she was an avid supporter of the Palestinians. I don't know where she is now. I, I have no idea because I, I was never really in touch with her before we went to get her. Her father is she, dead. She has a no. few... She has a few interviews here and there, but she actually, when uh, the reason she was on the plane that was hijacked because she was also living on a kibbutz in Israel. Yes, so that's right. So this also changed. She I mean, this also defies. In a, in a yeah, this defies the Zionist narrative that Palestinians were actually singling out Jews and yeah. so on because that 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 this doesn't really stand. Yeah. But that, to the but historical that wasn't record. true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but she was. She, she really spoke out in favor of the Palestinians when we got back. And uh, they did not like that. So that's why they decided to shut her up. Uh, if you're in touch with her, please tell her I said hello. No, I'm not in touch with her, but she's one of the people I'm actually looking forward to interviewing because the webinar was called Whose Narratives? And we really wanted to engage in histories and kind of like thinking about what happened just like we're doing today. What happened 50 years ago? How do people understand it? What is the role of women in the movement? Uh, what's going on? Because the Palestinian movement, just like the black movement, just like other movements, is always accused of being overtly homophobic, overtly misogynist, yeah. does not support yeah. women, and so on. But we have all these live examples from the way back when until today of strong women who are speaking. So there is there was a very strong interest for the Zionists to actually silence, not enable people to actually speak. It wasn't I mean, we really, we, when we invited Leila Khalid, we did not invite her to talk about hijackings. We invited her to talk, which is, there is another place for it. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk about it, but that wasn't the goal of the webinar. The goal of the webinar yeah. was talk about gender justice and resistance. And we actually had two Jewish participants. We had Roni Kasriels from South Africa, from the ANC, and we had Laura Whitehorn, who's anti-Zionist Jewish former prisoner in New York, who spent 14 years in prison and now working on releasing aged people in prison. And we had Seiko Odinga, who was uh, th 33 years in prison, who was also in the Organization of African Seiko Unity, Odinga. by the way. Yes. Seiko Odinga. And we yes. had also uh, the, the, the director of the Institute for Women's Studies at Mirzet University, which is the oldest institute in the region around women's studies. I mean, despite what the Zionists say and so on. And so this was a very interesting thing for the Zionists to actually silence it because it would have defied all the narratives, exactly like we're yeah. kind of talking about what was the history all about? What was going on at that particular time? What's going on today? What does this mean for the issues and so on? What does it mean for our students? I mean, you know, what we're trying to do is that I show the film Layla Khalid uh -huh. Hijacker in my classes, and I've written about Layla Khalid as I've written about Asata Shakur and other. So I thought this would be really amazing to actually bring a live person. I mean, this is like, imagine the treat of all of you being available for our students to hear from you. This is something that's not even written. It's, well, it's one, so one amazing, all thing, these stories, yeah. yeah. One last thing that Marty Mensch did for me is when we were in, uh, in, in Amman uh, hmm. and uh, we were under fire from the uh, Jordanian military. We were with the Palestinians and we were under fire from the uh, Jordanian military. As a matter of fact, at one point we went out for a walk in a tank leveled 50 caliber machine guns at us and we threw our hands up in the air quickly. Uh, but um, while we were on a balcony and there was shooting going on, 
um, I was talking with Marty about wanting to go make a film in Mozambique. And he said, he's got one piece of advice for me. He said, don't worry about the law firm. Don't worry about going back to the firm. Go make your film because, um, you know, you should never pass up an opportunity to do something that you really want to do that's worthwhile. And uh, that's much more important than working for the law firm. And yeah. he sort of inspired me to, to quit the firm when we got back and uh, go off with Bob Fletcher to, uh, to make the films. So I always thanked, in my mind, I always thanked Marty for giving me that encouragement. Now I, I, assume, Marty, I assume Marty also gave you some money. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. Once, once, I left, once I left the firm, I lost that decent salary. Mm, yeah. Uh, Ambassador, can you just maybe, move, maybe your, can you move your screen? You. Can you just move your screen a little bit because your half of oh, your face yes, is showing? I'm sorry. If you could uh, just like move it a little bit. Uh, yeah, this is no, no, a little bit. Uh, uh, no, back, back. Yeah, okay. So I want to no, get it I, back I, to, yeah. Sam, you have a good idea. I should have asked yeah. him for some money. I should have, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't plan it too well. Okay, too old, too too late now. But uh, let's yeah, let's take it back to. Too late just make sure your camera, your camera, you you your, your face is in the centered. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is good. Yeah. But if you move, just watch. Oh, gonna, so uh, I'm gonna okay. throw it back at Gail I, I and I Sam and Phil, and then we'll come back to you, Ambassador. I we'll come back you. to you, Ambassador, yes. because we actually have a lot of discussion. We want to talk about this statement as well. So I'm gonna yeah. take it back to you. Gail and uh, you know Phil and uh, Sam and maybe Salim and Anais want to say something. So. I just yeah, a quick question. I mean to try to get uh, uh, Sam and Phil and uh, back in and and yes, Salim and and Anais, any any input it would be welcome. But in terms of response, and you touched a little bit on it, um, Sam. But I specifically want to ask Phil and Sam, um, what kind of uh, can you just say a little bit more about the actual responses that you received? Um, at that time to the uh, to the document. I mean, aside from the the pushback you mentioned at Sarah Lawrence, um, but uh, you know, who were some of those, um, and what were those some of those voices like of people who were particularly uh, responding affirmatively uh, in 1970 at such a message? Um, Phil, I, I guess I'll, I'll go and then maybe Phil. Okay. Uh, sure. The. Folks in the community, let's see. Um, I was living in Harlem at the time, and uh, a lot of people read the New York Times, and and then the Grapevine be, before the internet, it was the thing we called Grapevine. Would right. Send copy, you know, copies, and people would get them, and the, the responses from ordinary folk to, um, you know, my my uh, university colleague was very positive. Um, like I said before, uh, those individuals in black academia that I touched base with to try to get them to sign on, uh, they didn't respond, mm -hmm. but everybody else did. It was, it was a positive response. Mm -hmm. Um, it, we tried at one point, we meaning Bill Strickland, uh, uh, and I, and probably a couple of other people tried to get, um, a interview going within the Amsterdam news. Um, but then again, you know, Zionism gets in the way, you know, the Amsterdam news had um, a lot of ads coming in from big uh, and small corporations, local and national. Uh, and I guess the, um, the editor, uh, I forgot his name at the time, um, the, the publisher was, uh -huh. was, you know, skittish about doing that. Because it was newsworthy. Here were a group of black people putting together an advertisement and posting it in the New York Times, dealing with the hot issue of the Palestinian struggle. Uh -huh. um, you know, so it was newsworthy. It was it was something uh, obviously that people were curious about. So we, you know, we, we I, I've got I, I got phone calls, um, a couple of letters. Um, uh, people in support. But one thing I did not get, which was interesting, 
was hate mail. I did not get that. Mm. So they, they knew I was at Sarah Lawrence College. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not get hate mail, which, which was I was ready for it. I was, you know, like you, 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 you're ready. You're geared up. Right, <laughs> it didn't right, come. right, right. It didn't come. Huh. You know, I, I, my, my gut feeling was that the statement was too black, too strong, and mm -hmm. that to give it um, a a negative light in the public, to give it a negative light in the public, will uh, just spread like a virus, you know, just go out even further. So mm -hmm. rather than come down on and, and, and with your typical hate mail kind of stuff, uh, uh, comments uh, in the newspapers and what have you or on television, they, they just, uh, they, the opposition, the Zionists and, and, and the capitalists who supported Zionism um, would just stay silent on it, you know, just, yeah. uh, just went Oh, over. can I just say yeah. something about this? Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting because uh, because it's like I think I, I think a couple of things. I'm not sure if I'm right. You know what? I'm gonna shut down Facebook. So, okay. so I think uh, I was looking at Facebook because it has um, captioning, so I can watch it better. But I'm I, I think there is a there is a couple of issues, and you, you we, I don't know if this is true, but I think one is historically. I think also Zionist uh, responses and so on also develop and grow and so on. So there isn't one particular one. Every context has its own thing. I think, secondly, uh, I don't, and this basically, I think, defies the, um, the Zionist claim that the Zionists were so influential, influential in the black support for the civil rights movement. There definitely were the Zionist Organization of America. There definitely was the Zionist embassy. There were the people that you already cited in the statement. But in terms of kind of grassroots and so on, this was just beginning. 67 was a very important turning point because it was when like a lot of there is a whole lot of history that people have written about many jewish writers anti-zionist writers and so on mm -hmm. have written about but it was there many people i think in the either in the civil rights movement were supportive of the civil rights movement i making a distinction between black between black power and civil rights and so on the, all of these things are there but there was but in the civil rights movement there uh, there was a strong jewish presence but I don't really think that that strong Jewish presence was Zionist. I think it took a while for that Zionist sentiment to develop uh -huh. and to grow and become more vocal. I think many Jews who were participating in the civil, in the, in the, in the peace and justice movement in anywhere and so on, and there are other people who can speak better to the labor movement and Steve Applebaum and so on. But historically, it was people who actually came out of the 20s, of the struggle around the whole question of the socialists, communists, anarchists, and so on, the union movement, uh, the support, uh, kind of like um, also the support against Nazism and fascism and so on, Second World War, uh, cautious account, ar around actually whether to support the US power or not to support power because there was also the Soviet Union at that time and the socialist camp and so on. And then you go, but then I think something broke in McCarthyism. I think something broke in McCarthyism because it was it was a very and then that's where also some of the Zionist forces developed. So that's I I don't want to I don't want us to kind of get into this too much because it eclipses what we're talking about the statement. But I think that is one major issue is that it's the history and a lot of the time people only talk about black history separately around Palestine. They talk about Jewish history and Zionism separately, Israeli history. And I think one of the things we try to do in these open classrooms and in these conversations to bring these histories together, to speak to each other, because when they speak to each other, it yields a lot of kind of like, maybe it yields even more questions, which is okay. I think that's like the best way for actually to learn and know uh -huh. and draw lessons for. So that's, I think the other thing is that I think Zionists also are, are sort of like strategize and think about whether to do or not to do, because there have been a lot of attacks recently. I mean, first of all, you lost your job. So what else are they going to do to you? I mean, you know, so they're going to send you a couple of like, I'm, I'm, I receive a lot of hate mail, but I still have my job. I mean, neither the Zionists nor the university have figured out how to, I mean, aside from harassment and retaliation every single day, they haven't figured out how to, how to get rid of me, right? Mm -hmm. But you have your job. I mean, you, you, you lost your job. Fred Dube in 1985 lost his job. He was fired by Como. Many people, uh, Mark Lamont Hill was fired from CNN. Uh, Angela Davis, 
the award was rescinded until we, there was a huge movement by many of us, everybody, and, and made the movement until the, the, the award was, was rescinded and, you know, given back and so on. So I think there is kind of like, I think designers are always testing their grounds because they're also, for instance, they've been attacking a lot of anti-Zionist Jews, a lot, a lot of anti-Zionist scholars and so on. And at some point they stopped doing it. Not because there are lesser, there are actually more anti-Zionist scholars and so on. But I think now they're thinking about, A, first of all, the right-wing agenda and the Zionist agenda are sort of almost the same, like, you know, and white supremacists. They're almost the same. They support all the attacks against uh, people who are protesting today. They're, 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 atta they're attacking, they're supporting Trump with the whole attack on ethnic studies, critical ethnic. They're, I mean, they're, the, the agenda is really terrible. They're in the White House. This is their connection, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that I think that they, uh, one of the things is that it, it's very convenient for them to just target Palestinians, Arabs or Muslims, because it's very clear for them then to say this is the enemy. Kind of like the enemy has a name, has a, has a last name, has a religion, has a face, has an accent, and so on. And a lot of the Zionist uh, um, uh, framing, just like the statement, it's about the national security of the United States. Just like in, in 67 and Vietnam, that this will be really good for the national security for the United States. By the way, a lot of support for South Africa also by the Zionists was also justifying why Israel is supporting South Africa. There is no justification that this is in the best interest of the United States. Israel is really important to the region because this is a strategic point of the United States. I mean, they keep framing it again and again. And then when you say, what's the interest of the United States? Definitely the interest of the government, not the interest of the people. It definitely does not reduce the prisoners. It doesn't give people welfare. It doesn't give people health care. It doesn't give people uh, climate just, uh, uh, justice. It doesn't, okay? So when they say that, and now there is a very, very big uh, emphasis among the Zionists, mm -hmm. especially ideologues, especially ideologues, like Campus Watch, Middle East Forum, the ones who are doing the theorizing, they are focusing a lot around the whole question of the national security. And then there is the dog whistle around black activists in the sense that they are very much supporting the, the FBI considering movement for Black Lives a terrorist movement. I mean, this is sort of like content brought back again. So I think they are actually, one of the things is kind of like defining the enemy. And it's very easy to make the enemy Arab, Palestinian, and Muslims, because it also gives the message to everybody else, don't even bother. It doesn't concern you. This is what goes back to the statement. Why did the statement in black, black statement come out around Palestine? Because it's a question of justice. It's a question of solidarity. It's not really a question of, you know, kind of like, oh, just because we love the Palestinians. So I yeah. think, I think, I, I think there is kind of like, and they have, and if you look at their strategies, which this is not, we should have another webinar about that. But here, I think this is, it all comes to it because sometimes they attack and sometimes they seize. Sometimes they attack and sometimes some rogue elements do it. And sometimes it's the people who are the leaders do it. But definitely, definitely Israeli government has, I mean, uh, Rich, uh, Richard Spencer has already said that he's a white Zionist after Charlottesville. Israeli Prime Minister Sonny Ayr Netanyahu said that uh, Antifa and Movement for Black Lives are worse, worse for Israel than the right wing, white supremacists, and so on. Uh -huh. I mean, this is the alliances are so clear. Trump is very clear who is he catering to. Sheldon Adelson, who is one of the mega multimillionaires who's supporter of Israel in Las Vegas, who's pouring tons of money now and has poured tons of money, especially after Trump moved the US embassy to Jerusalem and so on. They are very much invested in a very right wing agenda. I mean, when you talk about privatization of education and so on, this is it's we have a we have a, a holistic agenda, and these people have a very anti injustice, very white supremacist, and then the, don't forget the whole question of the collaboration in the in the whole question of policing and suppression and surveillance and so on between Israel and the U.S. Uh, police, and I refuse to call them law and order because I don't want to even acknowledge legitimization of wow. that. Okay, so I think I think this is this is all of the stuff is right there, and it definitely affects the black. Uh, uh, leadership, black activists, and so on. It affects all activists, indigenous, uh, Asian American, Latinx. It, it affects Jewish anti Zionists, it affects yeah. people who are working in labor, working people, and so on. It affects everybody because it's such like the guy, I will just went with this this guy, Rick Lamborn, who attacked us after we had the webinar. He's a right wing uh, congressman from Colorado Springs. The, I check his record. He's the one who went to oh. the Department of Justice and the Attorney General and said we should be investigated my colleague and I for criminal charges for doing this webinar, right? So what is his agenda? 
He's terrible on the climate. He supports Trump. He supported Trump uh, against impeachment. He supports the police in Portland. He is against women. He's against every single thing you can think about. The guy is, is a complete right-wing agenda that aligns. So I think it also contests the previous things of actually always saying progressive except on Palestine, because now this is reactionary on everything, including Palestine. And we are in a different kind of like, uh, you know, a uh, place where, 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 which I think the, the statement that you've done, actually really to go back to the statement, actually defines what the politics is then, and it yeah. defines what the politics is now. So, it's interesting because I mean, it, it, and what you just said uh, in terms of the connection to the uh, the, the police mechanism, um, whatever you want to refer to it. I mean, that's uh, very much uh, along the lines of what Bob was saying, the ambassador was saying about um, you know um, uh, apartheid, uh, that uh, historic. Uh, linking connection. But Phil, I wanted to, to bring you in and ask you, um, did you have any comments that you wanted to make about the um, um, the response at that time to the, uh, to the letter? Um, you uh, recall, and also just take the moment to remind people to please put your questions in the chat. Um, if there are any questions you have for any of the panelists, um, it'd be great to, uh, to hear from those who are uh, listening in. Uh, but Phil, did you, are you still with us, Phil? I must admit, I'm not feeling too well. This oh, morning. I'm so sorry. But, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, no problems. But uh, I did have a okay. couple of things to say about this, and I was having a little bit of a thinking about the statement in 1970 and why I wasn't totally t on top of the reaction to it. And I realized oh. I was in Cuba most of 1970, and they were okay. setting up the Vince Ramos Brigades. And uh, I've, I was there about seven months overall on three different trips. So I was aware of the statement, obviously. I signed it. And, uh, and, and SNCC was, at kind of had, was beginning to fall apart at the same time nationally. And um, so, but... Uh, so my, I'm a little foggy, and and to the degree that I remember it, it was more geared around intellectual debate and stuff around newspapers and mm -hmm. and, and the debate at that level. Not so much in the community. I don't remember in the community mm -hmm. so much debate. I could be wrong. Third point I want to say, though, which is what I do remember strongly, is the statement in, that we did in 1967, which was. And that created a tremendous amount of controversy, which I think bled into the 1970 statement. Because the thing that we said was Zionism is a form of racism. And that really polarized a lot of people because it wasn't talking just about Israel. It was basically talking about the people, particularly American liberals who supported Zionism. And so it's like, oh, am I a racist because I, su I support Zionism? And some of the liberal Jews in, in and around SNCC and the movement felt they could do both, that they could basically be a supporter of, 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 of Israel and, and support the civil rights movement and groups like SNCC. So when SNCC would take statements, uh, in this case, against Zionism, uh, and they had to really think that, more personally, where they stood, and in, in in regard to the struggle of the United States, mm -hmm. and got very defensive, and I remember a tremendous amount of feedback on that level, and trying to, I mean, you you, you don't even hear the statement that much anymore. Zionism is racism, which was the statement that basically came out of that document. Uh, it came out of a study that SNCC did around. The state of Israel in, in 1966 and 1967, and uh, basically coming out with the idea that Israel was a racist colonial nation, and uh, that basically formed the organization's politics around the question of Israel and who Israel was and why why they were playing such such, such a role in South Africa or Southern Africa, and uh, and so on. So I, I just want to put that point in because uh, uh, that predated the, the, the 1970 statement and created a lot of the rancor 
and division and debate mm -hmm. internal in SNCC and other people. Uh, and, and, and for a lot of our quote, white friends, associating with SNCC was getting to be dangerous because um, we had come out against the war in Vietnam. We supported the Vietnamese revolution, uh, uh, mm -hmm. 66 black power, and, uh, and then Zionism is racism. And then, and then of course, the, the statement in the New York Times in, in 1970. So there's a progression of events there that all are basically sharpening the, the debate and making it harder for liberals, yeah. particularly, who, in terms of being able to straddle both camps, made it much harder yeah. for them to do. The um, th th we see in the the um the chat, there's a link to that um that uh, statement, the the SNCC policy statements on Palestine. Um, so that that's good. Um, Sam, um, do you agree with um Rabab's uh, analysis uh, from the black perspective that Bayard Rustin question um uh is uh is um i think a you know an interesting um conversation piece uh, um do you have any comments or or thoughts around around that um uh, bayard um as he aged he became more reactionary mm -hmm. uh, he became more cynical of the struggle um and uh he isolated himself from the younger forces that were coming up. Um, he was in Harlem, but he isolated mm -hmm. himself from, from those of us who were coming up. And he, and he was very hostile, instantly hostile towards, towards us. Um, I think his allies were, uh, his close allies, people who would, who would not criticize him or critique him on his slip slipping to the right were those liberal Jews that uh, floated around in um, the New York Times, the New Yorker, um, the, the literary crowd, um, as well as some of the uh, older leadership of the, of the trade union movement um, in, in New York City at that time um, that, that he, he associated. He, he had an audience. They, they did not criticize him. So I, my, my sense is that there was a subjective factor that led him to be pro-Israel more than the objective factor of seeing uh, Israel as a surrogate um, police state for the U.S. Mm -hmm. the, the, the subjective factor there was, you know, he had people who supported who did not crit criticize his 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 movement? He, he he began to drift away even from the uh, sisters and brothers who were in SLC in, in New York City area, right? Uh, Y.T. Walker, for example, you know. He, mm -hmm. he drifted away from it. And I think the other factor that has to play in this is that he was an elder gay black man, mm -hmm. and. In a in a in a in a in a in a period where um, the, the the gay movement was uh, ignited and and and, and growing, um, and he had it, 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 my sense is that he had the opportunity to be explicitly part of that uh, and and help it put the, the political aspects of that and help it push it forward, but um, he he he. He opted not to do that, and and so I, I'm, in his latter part of his life, I, I'm really sense that this was a brother in in internal turmoil within himself about a number mm -hmm. of things. He became increasingly yeah. bitter, right, about um, uh, you know the the left, if you will, this cloud called the yeah. left, yeah. very much like um, uh, George Schuyler. Um, which a lot of people don't know, who's a black man, who was a, 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 a leftist, and he also participated in the United Negro Improvement um, um, Association, the Garvey Movement, and he, for whatever reasons, he began to drift. He drifted to be as far right as John Birch Society, right? 
<laughs> it, was, mm. it was crazy. He came all the way from the left, all the way over to the right all the oh. time. He's very bitter man. Um, he he tried to raise his his, his daughter, Philippa Skyler, in some crazy way of being the most European of young black girls as, as possible. Um, and mm. it just was a massive confusion for her. And she committed suicide before she was even, I think, 40 years old. Uh, but she was brilliant. She was a brilliant pianist. She was a journalist. She went to Vietnam uh, as, as one of the few black women in Vietnam reporting on the war uh, and, and so on. But, but you know, we, we as a people have these kinds of people that come up out of the movement that, that uh, have made major contributions to pushing the progressive causes forward, but then for a number of different reasons, wind up being um, bitter and, and, and chewing in on themselves um, to such a point where um, any, anybody, anybody who's black and progressive is, is, is bad, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, th th there's a number of people who we can point out that, that, mm -hmm. that uh, have morphed into that, that kind of being. So that's my sense of where uh, in, 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 in um, uh, the 1970s, where um, um, uh, the brother was in Harlem, living his life, um, getting it on a, a daily, very, very bitter. We would see him sometime on the street and try to greet him, and he would just ignore you like you were a piece of dirt, you know, just, <laughs> just ignore you, you know? It was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right. And then, wow. The next time I, I won't, I won't, I won't talk to you. you know? I won't want to engage. Wow, that's that's a yeah. shame. Um, uh, Gail, could I say one other thing? Sure. About, this is about Bayard Rustin, oh. mm -hmm. because uh, he was very influential in, in SNCC and around SNCC in the early '60s. Right. And right. a lot of people know. And Bayard was a great activist, a brilliant man, and uh, unfortunately. His politics, which became uh, separated from SNCC with, and, and the general mm -hmm. movement, the key place was in Atlantic City in 1964. And people may remember when Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Democratic Party wanting to unseat the racist um, state delegation of, of Mississippi and take their seats. And Lyndon Johnson basically coming out against that. And the politics that of the democratic, the liberal democratic and labor politics that Bayer championed was basically going toward power. And their major goal was to, to get Hubert Humphrey president of the United States. Right, right. And, right. and at a certain point, Bayer realized as a gay person, he could be around power, but couldn't actually be, get power for himself or his direct movements. And so he had to figure out who his allies were, and his, and his allies in terms of getting power were to the right, which was the mainstream Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I I say this because I think that's the point where everything gelled in terms of the conflict. And ever after that, he went increasingly to the right. Yeah. He tried to convince the civil rights movement not to to, to load out stop. Mm -hmm demonstrations and get into what he called coalition book politics. I have a book in my library where she writes about the importance of coalition politics. But who's the coalition with? It's basically the, the, the mainstream Democratic Party under Lyndon Johnson and also forces to the right and not building an independent grassroots movement, which he himself had been so much in favor of in the early 60s. Right, right. right. You know, this is fascinating, interesting. I just and I, I just I know um, that we really do want to be able to talk about um, the future and and kind of where where the the direction of things. I know I've got a question about whether we think a, such a statement now could um, could happen. But but um, there's a couple of questions already uh, in the chat. Uh, one is um, uh, a person asked, I was wondering if you could mention a little more about the early pro-Palestinian position taken by the Nation of Is Islam. And um, the influence of SNCC, of Ms. Ethel Minor, 
and Dr. Kwame Ture, especially in the 1967 newsletter and later, uh, uh, and later the statement. Um, so can anybody speak to, to that um, history? I, I think maybe Phil can, maybe Phil, maybe you all can speak to that. I can speak about the whole question of Islam and Malcolm X. Okay, well, let somebody I don't know that much about, about that. the nation of Islam and Palestine, but um, in terms of um, the, the, the latter part of the question, people like Ethel Minor and, and Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, they were major people. And it, I mean, I think in terms of Stokely, it came a lot out of the, his West Indian background and and the kind of uh, people who have been radicals from the West, Indi West, West Indies uh, consistently over time on international questions. And, and Stokely was very uh, upfront about supporting Palestine. And, uh, and, and because he was such a brilliant debater and, and he, he, he loved philosoph philosophical arguments. He d delighted in putting defenders of Israel kind of on the defensive and, and of course, making them angrier And because he was such a good debater. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, so he played, because in, in SNCC history, I mean, even before he was chairman, I mean, he was definitely around internationalism Supporting South Africa, supporting um, uh, movements uh, that they were they were in the Caribbean, and also, of course, making ties with Native Americans, Indigenous people in the United States, and and so that uh, had a lot to do with the support of Palestine, because they were the Indigenous people uh, of that area, mm -hmm. and um, F Ethel uh, was. Worked uh, was one of the people who worked a lot on the statement that uh, from the '67 study of Israel that I mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. She and Jack Minnis, who who was a a, a white uh, re re researcher, very uh, um, brilliant guy, uh, and uh, he's from the south. And um, they spent some time, really time, lo looking at the, the different uh, po policy of the Israeli government, the, the economics. Of the, of the Israeli government and basic, and its relationships with, of course, other places, places in the world as they tried to get more entry outside of the Middle East. And um, they felt it was very re reactionary and also definitely very racist. And uh, so they, they, they played a tremendous role on that level as well. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, in terms of the nation of Islam, um, Malcolm formed the newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. Uh -huh. And because the Nation of Islam did not have uh, editors um, and, 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 and journalists, um, he made a, a, a collaborative, he made a, 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 he created a relationship, partnership with um, Wolford. Um, John Woodford, yeah. Right. And, and, and Chicago, um, who, 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 in Chicago, Woodford was a brother who came out of the Communist Party. Um, and and, and the, the agreement was that, you know, he could cover, you know, he could cover um, X number of pages with news as long as Nation Islam had, I think it was eight pages or 10 pages in the, in, <laughs> in the Muhammad speak. So, uh, Woodford's internationalist politics came through the newspaper, the coverage of the Vietnam War, the coverage of the Palestinian struggle, the coverage of Algeria, the, the coverage of the nascent the beginnings of the African liberation struggles in Southern Africa, um, the coverage of how he covered uh, issues in the United States in terms of racism, all the, that shaped, that, that shaped um, Muhammad speaks, and, mm -hmm. and so when you, it was it, when you look at it uh, from on high, it seemed like a, a, a contradiction, right? From what you hear from the 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 what Muhammad Muhammad Elijah Muhammad says 
and, and what the newspaper is presenting in terms of news analysis is oftentimes two different things. But Palestine and the struggle in Palestinian was in the paper on a weekly, uh, it, it, sometimes on a weekly basis, but at, uh, at worst on a monthly basis. So black people, ordinary, everyday black folk who, who would pick up the tens of thousands, who would pick up Muhammad Speak, would get uh, news analysis about the Palestinian struggle and about all these other struggles in the world that they never ever be able to get from TV news or the local uh, uh, capitalist newspapers. So, so that, that influence, um, uh, that uh, the Muhammad speaks. Um, I, I, I really feel um, somebody needs to study that how it impacted in the black community. If it hasn't, if the study hasn't been done already, um, if it has, it should be publicized. How that paper had a significant impact, and particularly in the urban centers of of the United States, um, in terms of people, young people's development of the worldview. And <clears throat> the other factor is that with brother uh, Kwame Ture is that he comes out of New York uh, City. And New York City was relatively unique um, in terms of cities in, in, in the United States. New York City was a black cosmopolitan center. That is to say, um, you did not have just black folk coming in from Georgia and Mississippi uh, in North Carolina to, to your town. You had black folk coming in from all over the world and and the, their impact uh, in New York City as a, as, a cosmo, as a black cosmopolitan center was very, very solid, it was very, very solid that you, 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 you would run into um, easily um, somebody from some other part of the of the African diaspora in New York City. The saying back in those days was that um, in, in, in 1970 or 1967 or 65, if you stood on the corner of uh, 125th Street and 7th Avenue for 15 minutes and, and you were from, let's say, Namibia, you would wind up meeting somebody <laughs> who you know from your from 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 your area, you know. I, I mean, it, it was that that type of cosmopolitan, and and I think that that helped shape. I know it shaped me. I know it it, it shaped brother uh, Kwame Torre. You know, coming out of a cosmopolitan, uh, black cosmopolitan place like New York City. <clears throat> oh, I, I wanna, I wanna say, I can I, I, I say a small point. Ask somebody if uh, okay. Is that okay. Diane? Also okay. work for Muhammad Speaks. Oh, oh okay. So uh, Phil is speaking. I'm, I'll, I'll hold off. Go ahead, Phil. No, it's just a short point. He was talking about Muhammad Speaks. Uh huh. And I, I and, and I was Diane Nash, who may a lot of people may have known from the right. early civil rights struggle in the South. She basically moved to Chicago, where she still is, and she uh -huh. worked for years on Muhammad Speaks also. Not in this, not to the degree that John Whitford did around policy. But she was there around local issues, and 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 played a role. Yeah, I don't want to speak about uh, Muhammad speaks, but I was actually thinking about that. Whenever when you when you mentioned that, Sam, I was actually thinking about Mujahid. Mujahid was the paper for the Algerian National Liberation Front. That at one point, Franz Fanon was the editor. Right. And the reason my mind went there is because you've mentioned several things. I mean, a first of all, actually the. Um, um, Kwame Touri doesn't his family also comes from the Caribbean, same as Ilan Bebrat, by the way. And so then we have Franz Fanon, we have Stuart Hall, uh, Allah Yerhamu, uh, rest in power. We have uh, M.A. Cesar. I mean, there is something about, I think, the Caribbean uh, uh, legacy and the Caribbean intervention and so on. And then when you can also add the Spanish Caribbean, the you know, like the whole, the colonial powers and the anti-colonial. I think there is something there, and you talked about Garvey. I mean, there is all of the stuff, and the, the Jamaica, and so on, and Cuba. There is something there. I think it needs to kind of like be brought in. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because of the whole black internationalism. Because a lot of the time, you talked about cosmopolitan and so on. And I think it's also wherever people are at, because, you know, SNCC was in the South. SNCC wasn't in the North. Okay, and SNCC, people develop that kind of politics and that kind of understanding. 
So I think one of the things is to think about maybe the connections, what happened, who met whom, and so on. And I remember, Phil, I'm, I'm, I was quoting you earlier that you said when we had an event in San Francisco, you said that the first Palestinian I met was an Algerian. And then when Nesbeth Crutchfield and Terry, uh, Terry Collins spoke from the Black Student Union, they said that they actually, some of them have never ever met a, met a Palestinian. Actually, Terry Collins learned all about Palestine from a Jewish anti Zionist friend in the same place in Minnesota. So the reason I'm saying this is like there is so many grounds and there is so many roots that come in. But there is also, it raises also a question that we were talking about a little bit earlier about the, 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 the let's say, not maybe in a, a theological question, but the question of faith, the question of uh, the quote unquote black churches, let not just all black church, because Southern Christian Leadership Conference stayed away from that, from Palestine for a while, okay? Some there were contradictory positions during 67 and so on. But then SCLC actually came out in support of Palestinian youth who were trying to challenge the settler only buses a few years ago before, um, I think it was before Ferguson or something. But then you also have this very strong trend against Muslims in Islamophobia. That's not only, that's not only the property within black churches everywhere. But the thing is, is that, and it's also, there is the whole question of the Zionist influence within the Jewish religious community as well. So I'm bringing all of these issues, not to actually say any conclusions, but to complicate the question and think that this is something that's actually really worthwhile thinking about. Talking it also about Islamophobia. And I keep remembering Malcolm's speech in the battle, uh, the ballot or the bullet. He says, they always, they always say to me, Muslim minister, they never ever refer to Adam Clayton Powell or even Martin Luther as a Christian minister. They are Christian ministers. So there was this kind of like um, maybe foreignizing or the foreignness of Muslims and so on, even though the Nation of Islam actually is a, is a homegrown, is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. thing and so on. So there is something about that and there is something about the Zionist discourse around the whole question of Africa and history and so on. And this is also very prominent in the South African evangelical uh, mm -hmm. Zionist, pro-Zionist movements and the ways in which Israel and the Zionist movement is actually trying to bring uh, um, South African blacks to take them to Israel in order to change the whole equation and the whole history and mess up with the narrative around Upper Side, around Namibia, around uh, Zimbabwe, around South Africa and so on. So I think this is something that's really worthy of us to think about the internationalism, the history, the ways in which, and I, and I just, I, get, I guess I want to get to the point where the construction of uh, black people and people in the United States are, are quote unquote domestic. You know, kind of like domestic versus foreign. You're you're only supposed to be concerned about domestic issues. You're not supposed to be concerned as people of color, as indigenous people, black people. You're not supposed to be in, interested in international issues or I, this is foreign policy yeah. that doesn't really. And then the construction of Arabs, Muslims and Palestinians as foreign do not belong here. Yeah. And then the whole question is like, why are you even bothering with that? You shouldn't really. You have your own concerns. Don't even bother with it. And the statement, the statement and the history defies that. But there is also these other questions that I think really need to be discussed and really need to be complicated and really need to be studied and kind of like elaborated upon and so on. I agree about the cosmopolitan because I mean, you know, I mean, like I, I, I was fortunate to meet Kwame Tore and like hear what he says and the All African People's Revolutionary Party yeah. was also a socialist, you know, progressive movement as well. So I think that kind of politics is not outside of it. It wasn't white, it wasn't Cold War, sort of like, you know, this this whole anti-communist and so on. So that has also something to do with it and has to do with the capital and respectability and how people are supposed to behave and so on. You know, as we, we look at the, the clock, because we're kind of getting, I think, short, short on time, and I know you, you mentioned this, uh, Rabab, and I know others are really interested in talking about the future, where, where we're going. Um, there's so many great questions. Um, there was one question about uh, the um, religious delegations or de delegations sent uh, between Arab-based uh, uh, religious institutions um, uh, and uh, black-based religious institutions. And I think that that's something, and I'm really proud of this young man who's he's one of the applicants for the uh, Latin America School of Medicine who's tuned in. So glad to see him here. And it's a, it's a really good and important uh, conversation. I think something that we at IFCO need to be talking with the uh, with you, Rabab, and others uh, at how we can expand uh, 
uh, on that kind of partnership, that really kind of important partnership in the future. I know there's been conversations um, with progressive faith-based institutions more recently about uh, such a thing. But I, I, I just want to jump to um, uh, a question that um, Omar uh, Zazet uh, put in the chat, um, saying it's interesting to go back to these moments of solidarity because they help remind all of us that expressions of solidarity today actually have a long history that includes legacies of internationalism and radical joint struggle. Sometimes we fall into the trap of assuming that what we experience in the present is completely unique. My question for all of the panelists is how do you see the legacy of that, that, that letter that 1970 uh, statement in relation to the current wave of joint struggle and solidarity with Palestine uh, happening. And I would even just link on the, um, the, the struggles that are in the streets right here. Uh, and now as we're fighting um, the, the, the litany, the George Floyds and on and on and on. Um, so, you know, how do we make that, um, that connection? What are the lessons that we can learn? Uh, I, I think that, um uh, a question was raised about what about statement uh, today? I think that's a starting point. I think uh, you know if if we if if we can get a version two or whatever we want to call it statement in terms of uh, black people in solidarity with with Palestine in the twenty first century, um, that's a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, Post pandemic. Uh, attempts at uh, which has which has been ongoing uh, formally uh, sending groups of black folk in uh, to to Palestine if they can get into Palestine the, the, you know the, to to see and 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 show solidarity on the ground there is is, a, is another uh, form of, uh, of of action I think um, getting city getting city councils to uh, pass resolutions uh, stating solidarity with the Palestinian struggle is, 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 is something also that, that's important uh, that we can do. But, uh, but um, the, the knowledge base uh, is, is poor in our community. We have to now re-educate our people about the, the struggles uh, of, of Palestinians. And, and so that's uh, something that we can take up, with, starting with a statement um, and, and strategically placing that. I don't know, now we have social media, we can go beyond the printed media, um, you know, having a statement and, and then following that up with suggested things to, to read, people to invite, to do uh, pre, uh, further follow through presentations and so forth uh, on that. Um, we have to rebuild something um, that was more or less um, on solid footing 50 years ago. We have to rebuild that. And that takes a lot of time and nitty gritty work. But I think concretely we can start with the effort of uh, a, a new statement uh, uh, coming out of the present reality and, and linking it to the 1970, the 50 year old statement. Uh, and 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 then working it from there. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I will say a couple of things, and then I will uh, maybe Phil also and and uh, and Robert want to say something, and then leave it to you, Gail, to close. I want to uh, say a couple of things. Yes, I and I want to just mention that actually Sam was going to go to Palestine and ended up in Jordan and wasn't allowed to cross uh, the bridge to go to speak to Palestinians. Actually, about. Uh, Black liberation and social movements, which is, we have a lot of history about that, so we can talk about it, the oral history of, of this getting to Palestine. There are a lot of people who are going to Palestine, but at this point, in the age of pandemic, the only way we can communicate with each other is online. So I wanted to mention two things. One is the uh, start with that, which is also the very problematic notion that everybody is using Zoom. And we know that people have to use, have to use something to communicate with each other. But this is also part of the solidarity that at the very least, if people are using this, they should not make it business as usual. It should not be normalized. There is something wrong with a tech giant that actually has a veto power 
over the content of our classrooms and the content of what we say and so on, and they should be held accountable. So that's a very big statement that people really need to be supportive of us on. This is why we're on this platform, okay? And this, that Zoom developed itself, other people can develop itself. Secondly, I wanted to also bring up the question, in addition, I agree with Sam, but also one of the issues that are actually we're facing us now is the whole question within critical ethnic studies. So critical ethnic studies has, ethnic studies has been seen as a property of people of color and four groups of people of color, indigenous, black, Asian, and Latinos, okay? And so now there is a very big Zionist attack to undermine the way we teach, the critical nature of the way we teach ethnic studies, and also to expel Palestine, Arab, Muslim studies from it. I mean, this is a huge, huge battle. And I think this is something that we really need to talk about. And I think this whole discussion that we're having now and coming together and building the knowledge base as we are the whole education, we're all educators, to actually think about that in a very meaningful way, in a way that actually impacts where we're at and how do we do our learning and so on. And, and, and try to address all of these questions and so on. Obviously, the conversation is not finished. There is so much to do. But it's just a question of kind of like thinking about there's some things that we people need to do something about right now and at connections and so on. And then other things actually kind of like we already talked about doing something really major for May 19th, which is the birthday of Malcolm X and the passing of Elan Bebrath. We were supposed to have a whole honoring of Elan Bebrath on his birthday at the end of September. But due to our to the cancellation of our webinar and the attacks against us and so on, we just simply and we couldn't even find another platform at the time. So we had simply we, we couldn't even do it. It was supposed to be also the 50th anniversary of the passing of Jamal Abdel Nasser to talk about 1970 to link it to the statement. Mm -hmm. We had to. I mean, this is this is how these attacks actually basically silence us. We rise. We're doing this. This is really great. So this is the question of kind of like, what do we do? How do we go? Where do we go from here? Excellent points, and thank you for. Um, I'm I'm learning about uh, Streamyard. I never knew anything, so just grateful for for that experience. And, and as we talk to our friends in Cuba, we find the same thing that they they're not able to use Zoom. So I think that that's a really critically important point that you're making, um, Dr. Abdul Hadid. And we we all need to be thinking, you know, expanding uh, our knowledge base. Did Phil or uh, the ambassador, anybody else, want to come in and? talk about uh, connecting this uh, 1970 statement to the future. Uh, any thoughts on um, uh, how we learn from this, this intergenerational conversation that we're having? Well, I'll be brief. Uh, I, I like what Sam said, and uh, thinking about the possibility of updating it to the 21st century and, uh, and how we would go about doing that. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good points. Well, um, Robert is speaking, but he's muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you muted? Yeah. Now he's on. I guess. Yeah. There you are. What, was I muted? Okay. Uh, one thing that I think it's very important to remember is not to let the enemy define us because they will try to tell us that what we're about is something new and unprecedented. Not true. We are part of a continuum. Um, our struggle has for a long time been very international and had very, very many examples of solidarity uh, put into practice and not just theory. And, uh, you know, when the United States established um, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and it was the United States that did that, uh, and uh, when they sort of twisted arms and got recognition from three countries in the Arab world for uh, Israel and good relations. Well, actually only two recognized Israel formally. Uh, the third one uh, has decided to normalize commercial relations with Israel. Um, this is not something new. Very little was actually changed in the Middle East as a result of these actions. 
but we've got to remember and bear in mind the history upon which all of what we do is built, uh, what uh, was built. So yeah. um, I, I just don't think that it's wise for us to let them get away with saying that this is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do, what we do with the Palestinians is not unprecedented. It's perfectly natural and normal and should be encouraged as something that is normal and uh, that does have precedent. So don't let, don't let them put us in a little box and say that uh, for us to think about Palestine is unusual somehow. It's not unusual, it's perfectly normal. Wow. Well, I think those were all you, excellent um, uh, statements. Uh, and and um, I, it's been an honor to really, like I say, to be here and to have learned. I wanna just thank um, um, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Abdul Hadi. What a, what a wonderful collection of uh, people and uh, information that you've brought together. Uh, and of course, all of the, the, the panelists, uh, Sam Anderson and Phil Hutchinson and um, Ambassador Van Leer, who will, I'm so sorry that, um, that um, we weren't able to hear from Fran Beal, but appreciated what you had to say, um, Professor, in terms of just sharing uh, some of the, her comments. Um, I know that, what was that? Gave us her she gave us your practice. There you go. And well, you all she really her uh, tied her in in, in really uh, um, uh, important ways. So thank you all for representing her. Um, do, we, we have, do we have any idea how many people were watching this? That's where we have to ask maybe Salim or? Uh, yeah, so it fluctuated uh, uh, to 50 people um, right now. Uh, 34 people are currently watching. So hello to on the, the stream people. yard, right, Salim? On the just stream on, yard. Yeah, just on stream yard. But if folks like shared it beyond that, and it's going to be preserved online, so people will right. watch it. It'll have an afterlife of its own. And and it's just to say, I want to also just again thank uh, Eyewitness Palestine. That was Omar from Eyewitness Palestine question, and yeah. National Students for Justice in Palestine because they both gave us the platforms on uh, Facebook as well as YouTube to be able to carry it because YouTube continues to block us, but they actually basically gave us a live say, yeah, we're blocked by YouTube uh, over the webinar. We were blocked by YouTube, by Facebook, and by Zoom. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the university did not do anything to actually challenge them to yeah. not yeah. allow not to. But anyway, they actually made it possible for us. So this is now live on Facebook and live on on YouTube, and there is multiple platforms on Facebook, multiple of our co-sponsors that Anais mentioned that also carry it. So we expect when we did the the Black La Black Liberation on July 21st, uh -huh. I think we started with 500. Now we have over 9,500 views. So that's a great. I think people will watch. I think people will learn. I think yeah, this yeah. is. That's important. And I, I just want to point to the evaluation form, the link to the evaluation form that are in the various um, uh, chat boxes on the screen. Um, uh, and uh, they've been posted uh, no matter which platform you've used. So I'm sure it'll be really important to, to get feedback from, uh, from all who are able to attend. And uh, it'll be very helpful for the organizers as we uh, consider uh, future um, programs. I'm, I'm saying we, do you see how I, I've just jumped in? I'm, 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 I've really, I've learned so much and uh, really appreciated just this opportunity to be with you all. Um, and uh, just grateful, grateful for what I've been able to learn. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I'm how glad, I'm glad that we got Phil. Um, I hope he gets, gets to feel better soon. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, can I just say one more thing? Sure, absolutely. The elections are Tuesday on November 3rd. I want to say no matter what happens, November 4th, we wake up and we continue organizing. We continue struggling. We continue until all of us are free. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I won't be able to, unfortunately, because uh, I volunteered to help Mr. Chump move out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be busy well, that's not until January. <laughs> helping to load up his truck. 
You said you said you'll be busy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, Peace. thank you again, everyone, okay. and uh, look forward until the next time. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.